And it is time for today's pre-show of our 2201101 Core 1A Plus Study Group. Hello, everyone. Welcome aboard. Hello, chat room. Hi, everybody. I can't even see the chat. I haven't even popped out the chat yet. Let's do that. Let's pop you guys out so I can at least get you in my eye line. There we go. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. It was a little touch and go there here in my particular area. Let's see if we look at the radar. Bad storms coming through. Just enormous, awful, miserable tornado type storms have just rolled through here. And amazingly, we still have power and internet. I know, don't say it too loudly, but it's working. Everything is working right right now. So we're going to go with that. We're going to say that it has something to do with fate or kismet or something. And we're just going to keep doing this as long as it allows me to do it. So thanks for joining me. Um, that's sort of my apology in advance. If we happen to run into technical issues, it's probably expected today. Uh, but we have all new questions. I have all new in this first hour, all new questions that I've got ready for you. I've got Plenty of questions that have come in for the after show. In fact, I think I've got the questions. I need to look on my side, make sure Q&A is up. It is. You could even leave a question right now before we even get to the second hour. So you've got options. you got things you can do. So that works great. Hope everybody's doing well where you are. Hope everybody is safe and out of any type of bad weather. It was uh it was these crazy 50 mile an hour winds that came through this morning, literally in the last hour. That's how that's how tight it has been. I was hoping it would come through in the evening or it would be later in the day. No, right when I'm ready to do a live stream. Of course it is. Um, but you can't you can't plan for these things. You just kind of have to figure out what happens. I was I was ready to push this until later today, until next week, and but it, it so far it's turned out okay. So we're gonna we're going to ride with that. We're going to go with that. I think we'll be all right. I see everybody in the chat rooms checking in. Hey, everybody. Evan says, hello. Uh, uh, your lessons and prep tools helped me get my first IT job. I'm a knock tech for an ISP and a great place to start right there. Just tons of things to learn when you're at a network operations center, especially one for an ISP. So soak in all of that IPv6 that you're going through, soak in all of the routing and the switching and the VLANs and the subnetting and everything else that surrounds that. It's a, that's a good time. That is a, that's a fun ride. So enjoy that one while you can. Learn as much as you possibly can. That's one of those environments where you're going to be learning so much that uh, you'll get out of there and into some cushy corporate job and you'll wonder, why isn't anybody working around here? <laughs> Because everything is always so busy and on fire when you're in those type of operation centers, uh, which is just normal. That's the way it's supposed to work. So it's a great place to learn, and you should absolutely take advantage of that. That's fantastic. Oh, it is. it was quite a storm that came through, so I'm pretty happy about that. Is that really a fireplace behind me? Everybody wants to know. This fireplace, that one right there, that one, the, the one that I have here, should we, should we once and for all just... Since it's the pre-show and it sounds like I'm ready to go, here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to see if I have legs. We do. And look at that. It's a real fireplace. Told you. Told you. I think that's the first time we've ever turned the fireplace. <laughs> I should have just let it ride for years. I guess I have. Uh, trying to let it let everybody know. But we can't leave that on because it would get warm in here really, really, really quick. So we don't do that. Uh, did I get younger? Yes, I am. I am aging backwards. Backwards. We're going in reverse uh, to do that. Why can't you send a super chat? I don't have super chats turned on. Sorry about that. No super chats, no super thanks anymore. It got to be more of uh, a problem for me to keep up. <laughs> really my problem. The problem was mine. Um, plus, it was sort of encouraging you to donate money in ways that I was not really happy with. I want you to get good training materials and not, I don't want this to focus on on what's happening during these live streams. That's not why I do the live streams, is not to, to make money. Um, 
the the live stream is have fun and learn something. And if it brings you back to the videos or brings you back the course notes and the other things, that's fine too. And we'll just let those things happen organically. If I've done my job properly, that's what will happen. If I have not done my job properly, it will be the opposite of that. And that's not good either. But that's the way it goes. At least you get instant feedback. Whenever, whenever things go south, that's, that's kind of the case. You have your CompTIA 901 and 902. Do you think you can study from it? You cannot. Everything's changed so much every time they make a change in the exams. So the 901 was updated to the 1001. The 1001 is updated to the 1101. That's where we are today. And so you've had two changes, two big updates. So I would, I highly, highly recommend only studying from materials that match the version of the exam that you're planning to take. That is an important standby for me. Uh, do I offer voucher packages that include a retake? I do not. Uh, CompTIA doesn't. Uh, CompTIA is technically the only ones that sell those. Um, there are other people out there who are CompTIA partners that finance the voucher uh, retakes themselves, which I'm just not willing to do. So no, we're not gonna. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna see, we're gonna see how things go from there. One never knows. Uh, one never knows. Uh, let's see what else we got going on. Um, the 601 does retire in July, so that's good. Uh, if you're working towards that, you got plenty of time. You got six months, a little, a little over six months, six and a half. So you're still good there. The 701 content is out as well, so you have that too. You got you got some options. Okay, how are we on time? My uh, my clock keeps turning off on me. Let's put the nightstand back up, and let's uh, let's move this around. I think we got about three minutes to go, and then we'll get started. Thank you, thank you everyone for being here. I'm so glad that you made it. I'm so glad that we're on the air. I'm so glad that everything looks good. Uh, recordings are up. Streaming looks fine. 3%. That's what we want. That looks good. Uh, video cameras, the camera slots are working. Everything looks fine there. All right. I think, I think, I think we're in good shape. It's so good. It's the CERT Learn Practice. I think the CERT Master Practice is the one you're referring to. Uh, for there. Am I into music? Not really. This is all to create training materials. That's this whole thing is, is really just about creating video and, and uh, other content. That's all we focus on here. Uh, I don't have any musical instruments in here any longer. I had a keyboard in here for a while, uh, but I took it out. It's not in here at all. So there you go. That's, that's what we're doing here. I used to play piano quite a bit. When I was much younger, I'd play for weddings and things like that. But as time goes on, you sort of lose your practice. And you kind of forget how the keys work, <laughs> which button does what, which key does what. Um, and I was never really that good. I was good enough to get through a wedding, but I would have loved to gotten into music theory and sort of sort of the jazz piano kind of thing. <laughs> Don't give up on my dreams. Thank you. <laughs> that, made me, that made me laugh. Thank you. Because this is a dream. This is, this is the dream right here. Kind of glad the music thing didn't work out because this worked out pretty darn well. I'm pretty happy with how things are going. Uh, what do I think about the WGU Cybersecurity Information Assurance degree? I think it's pretty good. I've looked through the WGU stuff. It looks really good. Uh, they have a nice mix now it's very it's very heavy on the certificate side on the certification side. Um, that's that's sometimes good and sometimes bad. So that's that's it. My problem is that I like the concept of jazz piano, but not necessarily the music. <laughs> what? I know, that's me. That's that's my brain putting music into things. I, I can't make it work. I'm not I'm not good enough to add my own flavor into it. It has to be written on the page and I have to play it as it's written. It's difficult for me to come off of that page. Um, I can do it, but it's, it's a challenge. That's when you realize pretty quick, well, wait, maybe that's not going to work out so well. Maybe that's not, maybe that's not going to be great if you do that. Well, you might be right. All right, let's see. It's 12 noon straight up. I can't believe it. So 
now is a good time to prep and get ready. Let's do a live stream, everybody. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the January 2024 Professor Messer 220-1101 Core 1A Plus Study Group. In this study group, I'm going to ask you questions that come from the 220-1101 Core 1A Plus exam objectives. And somewhere in there, we'll look at the answers, we'll figure out why things were right or why things were wrong, and we'll go through a number of questions in this first hour. So stick around for that. In the second hour, we sort of still have a show going. I call it the after show because I'm not asking you questions any longer. Instead, I will be taking questions from you in the after show. So there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of everything that we're going to be doing today. Me asking you questions, you asking me questions. We'll start this with uh, a number of different ways that you can participate live. So if you are here on this live stream, you are here on this 12 noon on a Tuesday Eastern time, and it says live in the corner of the video, then you can visit this webpage, professormaster.com slash QA, and you can answer questions that might be there on that webpage. I'm going to bring up a question right now that's actually a question from last week. Uh, this, this last week's question is the only time you're going to get a question that is one that we've done before. So this next question is one that describes uh, a problem that you might run into. So you're going to need to know about this. We call this our rewind question. This question asks a, I guess if I hit that button, you'll be able to see that a user's laptop computer randomly powers down during the workday. And the technician suspects a thermal issue. Which of the following would be the best way to gather temperature information on this computer? Would it be safe mode, event viewer, system BIOS, task manager, or Windows update. Now, the important thing when we're answering questions in this first hour is please don't answer the questions in the chat room. Instead, you want to use the links that are on your page right now. This professormesser.com slash QA will get you there. Or you can pop open a new browser window and visit vvox.app directly, and it will ask you for an ID number of 13155486 which sounds like a lot to type in. So I would recommend you simply go to professormesser.com slash QA because it bypasses all of that. You can simply type in the easy part to get to this particular question. When you get to that page, submit your answer. We will come back to these questions in just a bit to see how you do. Well, thank you for joining us on this live stream. One of the things that we do during these live streams is talk about the 220-1101, the 220-1102 are really a lot of different topics. And we can go through many different Q&A type things in the after show for this as well. When we're not here doing a live stream, you can find us on YouTube where all of our training videos are. Every video, every minute of every video is on that YouTube channel. Nothing is left out. Nothing is behind a paywall. They're simply there for you to visit. You don't have to register anything. You visit that by going to professormesser.com slash YouTube. You can also go to professormesser.com slash Twitter and slash Instagram if you would like our daily pop quiz question. So you have a number of different things that you can visit when we're not here and live. We'll talk about more places where you can get information when we're not here and live. Sometime during this first hour, though, I want to remind you that you will get a continuing education unit code. And I will explain sometime in this first hour how you can submit that code to earn that hour of a webinar category CEU. So stick around in this first hour. Keep your ears ready for that particular one. You have some different ideas uh, of things you might do. Uh, that's that's a, a good place where you can start anyway. The 2201101 and 2201102 are the current A-plus exams. There, whenever there's a new calendar year that starts, we just passed the, the New Year's 2024. And a lot of people wonder, well, do they update these every year? Is there a 2024 version of the exam? There is not. That's not how they do things. Instead, they release updates approximately every three years or so. This current version of the exam was released on April the 20th of 2022, which means that we have an estimated retirement date for this exam of somewhere around October of 2025. 
That means that you have plenty of time through all of 2024 and through most of 2025 to be able to answer this particular or, or pass this particular series of exams. You need to pass both of these exams to earn your A+. The exam itself is 90 minutes in length. On the 2-2011-01, you need to earn a 675 on a score that has a range between 100 and 900. It's an odd range, but there it is. We also, on the 1102, have to score a little bit better. We have to score 700 on the 1102. And if you're here on Thursday, we're doing another one of these study groups for the 1102. Make sure you check in there. Once you earn your certification, and you pass this today, your certification is good for three years. So it really doesn't matter when the exam retires. As soon as you're certified, You've now got three years until that particular certification expires. And you can renew it, of course. So even after that three years, you can continue to renew your cert without ever having to take these exams again. So that makes it very, very easy. Also let you know that today we're going to be talking about topics from the 1101 exam, which means we'll be talking about mobile devices, networking, hardware, virtualization and cloud computing, and hardware and network troubleshooting. And we will find all of that. We will go through all of those different topics in the study group. Certainly, there will be different options there to be able to discuss. Also let you know that there, this live stream, this video version of this live stream will be available for you to watch immediately afterwards on YouTube. I also have an, an audio only podcast version that I distribute. That one's usually available later in the day or sometime the following day. You can find that if you'd like to subscribe with your podcast listening program. You can find that at professormesser.com slash podcast. Also let you know that when you go back to YouTube, probably sometime tomorrow, my marketing manager, Lori, who's watching this replay. Hey, Lori, how you doing? She's going through all of this and putting timestamps into the YouTube video description. This makes it very easy to find information and find a particular question, find something in the after show. And they're all in the YouTube video description that all happens thanks to that hard work from Lori. And if that's something you like and that you use, make sure you mention that in the chat since she watches the chat as it's the live replay chat as it's going by. Now, very, very useful to have those there. Also let you know that when we're not here live, you can join our Discord. Our Discord can be found at, you probably guessed it already, professormesser.com slash Discord. You just type in professormesser.com slash the name of the thing you would like to find me on. And if I'm there, you will find me on that. If I'm not there, it will not find me on that. It's very, very scientific. Um, I really designed it that way. Professormesser.com slash Discord is where we usually hang out. It's a great place to meet a lot of other people who are also studying for their certification exams. And it is a fantastic community that these folks have created there. Uh, I just sort of built the, the service, let them run with it, and it really has worked out very, very well. So have a look at the Discord. That's usually where I'm hanging out after the live stream as well. Eventually, you will need to take the exam. And if you're in the U.S. or Canada, I have discounted vouchers available on my website. So why would you pay full price over at the CompTIA site when I can give you the same voucher for a discounted price? It's already on the website. You don't need a discount code. You don't need any special coupons. You just show up and it's already discounted. What could be easier? Not only that, I will give you additional information. I have my exam hacks ebook available. And if you purchase this on my site, your voucher on my site, you'll get the exam hacks ebooks free to download absolutely free that gives you some tips and tricks that you can use to earn a few extra points on your exam. So have a look at that. You can find out more about the discount of vouchers at professormesser.com slash vouchers. See if that works. Uh, if you're you're trying to find a discount, that might be a good place to find that voucher discount for you. Let's go through and find the answer to the question we asked earlier, which is a user's laptop computer randomly powers down during a workday, and the technician suspects a thermal issue. Which of the following would be the best way to gather temperature information on this computer? Would it be safe mode, event viewer, system BIOS, task manager, or Windows update? And one of the things that we like to do is to 
see how we remember things from last month. We can see that 59% of you say it's System BIOS. We have 25% that say Event Viewer. Task Manager got 10% of the vote. And then you have 4% for Safe Mode and 0% for Windows Update. Poor Windows Update. Didn't really get anything in that particular list. Well, the real question here wasn't necessarily about solving the problem. It was more about gathering more information, which is probably a good idea when you're addressing some type of issue, is to collect as much intel as you can about this particular problem. And when you're dealing with things like intermittent shutdowns and problems with uh, with certainly thermal-related issues, you're probably going to want to see what is the temperature inside of your computer. Now, fortunately, there are tons of sensors inside of your computer and lots of thermostats, so you can find those. There's a uh, sensor in your CPU. There's one that's in your storage drive. There are some in the case itself. There's others on the motherboard. And you need some way to be able to see what are the temperatures inside of your computer. From the list that we had here, which was Safe Mode, Event Viewer, System BIOS, Task Manager, and Windows Update, the only one of these that really gives any valuable information about, or really any information at all, about the temperature of those sensors would be the System BIOS. Would that be the best choice to use if you were trying to get temperatures? Maybe not. There's probably a third-party utility or some other uh, motherboard utility that you could launch. There's even third-party utilities that can tell you a lot about those temperatures. We've talked about some of those in our course in other places. But when you only have the choice of these, because the question asked which of the following would be the best way to gather temperature information, given those five, the only one that really helps and that can provide you with any temperature information is the system BIOS. That's where you want to be is the BIOS information that's in your computer. So if you're someone who is working on your system BIOS, you can find all kinds of information in there, especially for troubleshooting, and especially with the newer UEFI BIOS. There's lots of information that you can gather, including temperature information. So that's the right answer. System BIOS, Safe Mode, Event Viewer, Task Manager, Windows Update. Do not have information there that can tell you about the temperature inside of a device. You guys did really well on this. We did not do that well last month. So you either, you've been studying, you remember last month, regardless, you did much better. And that's what we're trying to do here is to figure out how we can do better on this exam. Let's now shift gears a little bit because as many of you know, I like to give you a performance-based question as your first new question of the study group. So performance-based questions are anything that isn't multiple choice. That's how CompTIA defines a performance-based question. For example, the last question we had was a multiple choice question. There was a question and multiple choices to select from. Well, the questions you get at the very beginning of your exam are not multiple choice. And you need to be careful with this because some people don't realize that this is the case. And suddenly, the first four questions on the exam are these relatively involved performance-based questions. They don't realize that they also get a lot of multiple choice right after this. And so I want you to also be able to have a look at these performance-based questions. So I want to give you a performance-based question that is a matching question. This one is a question about printers. This question asks you to match the printer to the description. We have four different printers here, but we have five, six different descriptions. So there will be some descriptions left over that we aren't working on. Now, as, as always, of course, you want to go to the link that is on the screen to be able to answer this. As always, please, no answers in the chat room. Please, no hints in the chat room. You want to go to professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. So your question here is matching the printer to the description. The four printers that we have are thermal, laser, inkjet, and 3D. Those are your four printers that you have to choose from. And here are the descriptions. The first is a solid filament is melted for the final output. The second is drops of pigment are combined to create the output. The third is small pens are used to print different characters. 
Fourth is heat is applied to display page output. The fifth is pigment is heated and fused to the page. And then a ribbon transfers ink to the printed page is the last description. So you've got these six different descriptions, but you only have four printers to fit those into, which means two will be left over at the end. And the ones that are left over, if you can even think about what those would be, I'd like to maybe figure that out as well. Maybe we'll do a little extra credit when we get down to that view. If you would like to answer this question, you can simply put in the number in the letter. So if you think the answer is 1A2B3C4D, that's all you have to submit. Visit the link that's on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, to lock in your answer. And then I'm looking at some of the answers coming in on this side as well. Knowing what a printer can do, knowing its capabilities, and, and perhaps even more importantly, knowing how to troubleshoot it can be an important part of the exam. So make sure that you are very, very familiar with what those different options are. Uh, also, to remind everybody, please don't answer in the chat room. Please, no hints in the chat room. You want to go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. It's that link that's on your page right there to be able to figure out what the right answer might be. This is uh, one that you do have to know about because printers, it, there's a nice section of printers in the hardware section. It's not enormous. But it is significant because you have to know every single one of these printer types and another one. There's five different printer types. I only have four that are on this list. So make sure you're familiar with what those would be. And let's step through each one of these and see if we think we know what it would be. A number of you have submitted your answers already. So let's give it a shot and see what we would like to put on these. This would be, this would be pretty good. This is this is an important, as, as other people are saying in the chat room, yeah, we've run into printers on this exam. We know that printers are going to show up somewhere. There's just uh, a statistically, you're probably going to get at least a question or two about printers. Let's try our printer question here and what we might have in this list. Uh, do I have the, the pages not on my list? So we're going to put this up on here. Let's see if I even have this on I have the same I have the same one in this list. So I did not even move these around to create to create the answer pages. So we're going to do this live and figure out the details of this just by looking at this page. I think it'd be a little easier than having a look at what I have on my screen. So let's start with a thermal printer. A thermal printer, as you're probably familiar with thermal printers, and the name certainly implies, is thermal printers deal with heat. They're not the only printer that deals with heat, but there's definitely a very close relationship between heat and the printed page. Not the only printer that deals with heat. And if we look at the different options that are here, we want to be able solid filament melted. Well, there's some heat there, but a thermal printer does not use solid filament as its method of printing. Drops of pigment on the page. Nope, drops of pigment are not what we're going to use. Small pins, there's no heat there. Finally, we get to D where heat is applied to display the page output. And that is the most important part of a thermal printer is it's putting heat directly on the page itself. Special chemicals on the page are built to react to that heat and change color. And when you do that, thermal printer is absolutely going to match heat applied to display the page output, which is option D. Next on our list is a laser printer. Laser printers, these are a little more familiar to us. We've seen these in office places. They're even relatively expensive. Many people have them in their homes. And if we have a look at a laser printer, that's the other printer type where there is some uh, heat that is used for a laser printer, but it's not a direct relationship to the information that is on the page. In fact, what you will find is answer E is that pigment is heated and fused to the page. I used pigment in this particular answer to refer to the toner, the little toner pieces that are melted to the page. So make sure you're familiar with those different printing characteristics. They will become important on the exam. So the answer to two would be E, pigment is heated and fused to the page. That fuser is that most important part to be able to work through those. Uh, the third on our list is inkjet. Inkjet is one where you're putting 
little bits of ink on the page to create the output. And that matches what we have in answer B. Drops of pigment are combined to create the output. That is exactly what you would find with an inkjet printer. And then lastly, we have the 3D printer. And in 3D printer, we have certainly a lot of useful capabilities there with 3D. We're seeing so many people do interesting projects with those. And a 3D printer works by having this solid type of filament, just this very solid piece that you heat to make it pliable. We then use the 3D printer to place that heated filament in the correct place. That filament then cools to create that final 3D output. So the answer to four is a solid filament is melted for the final output or option A. So there were a couple that we did not choose. We did not choose option C. Small pins are used to print different characters. We also did not choose option F where a ribbon transfers ink to the printed page. Both of our, those are the same type of printer, which would be an impact printer. Impact printer does have small pins in the print head. Not the only type of impact printer. There are many different types, but that's certainly one type that is specific to a dot matrix printer. Then you've got a printer transferring ink to the printed page using a ribbon. That is absolutely very common on impact printers. Again, not the only type of method of getting ink on the page on an impact printer, but probably one of the most common. So those are the answers for today's performance-based question. Maybe you're familiar with some of these options. Maybe you aren't. But make sure you read through all of the descriptions and the troubleshooting processes for thermal laser inkjet 3D and impact printers. They will most certainly show up on your exam. And if you, if you realize maybe you didn't do great on this particular question, absolutely go back to that printer section of the video course and it's going to be incredibly important for you to know about those printer pieces. It will certainly help you to be able to do that. Not all impact printers are dot matrix, which was a question that came in from Matthew in the chat room. Uh, for example, I used to work in a very large computing center with mainframes and other types of computers. And we would print high speed output on an impact printer that was a chain printer. Chain printer has a chain of letters that are spinning around inside of the printer at a very high rate of speed. You can think of the belts that are inside of your car engine that are spinning very rapidly. This was a chain of letters that was spinning around in the printer, and there would be a head that would hit the chain right at the right spot to be able to push through the ink and put something on the page. Really quite remarkable to be able to do that. So hopefully this is an answer and a question that has helped you and you now have more information about this particular printer problem. Hopefully, it's something that, that you can become very, very familiar with. So have a look at some of those. Let's shift gears now back to a, a, a question that is more traditional. We have more of the multiple choice based question. So we'll move to those as well. The next question on our list is this one. A company is hosting all of their user desktops in a cloud-based infrastructure. Which of the following would best describe this configuration? Would that be VDI, IPsec, APIPA, DDoS, or VLAN? have a few options there. A company is hosting all of their user desktops in a cloud-based infrastructure. Which of the following would best describe this configuration? Is it VDI, IPsec, APIPA, DDoS, or VLAN? If you know the answer, follow this link, professormesser.com slash QA, to lock in your answer. See if you know what this one might be. This is um, whenever you get into these exams, there's always a little bit of the exam that talks about the cloud. Um, this is one where A plus and network plus tend to have very similar topics along cloud technologies. The security plus tends to take it the next step and certainly focuses more on the security side of things, at least certainly through the most recent version of the security plus exam, the 701, which is very different on well, pretty much everything. Uh, if you're someone who's studying for your Security Plus, we have a Security Plus 701 study group later in the month. Make sure you check our calendar, professormesser.com slash calendar, to be able to figure out when that event is going to be so that you know exactly when we will be going live. 
So let's see how we did with this one. A number of you have locked in your answer, so it makes me think that we know what this is. The question we have in front of us is a company is hosting all of their user desktops in a cloud-based infrastructure. Which of the following would best describe this configuration? Is it VDI, IPsec, APIPA, DDoS, or VLAN? Let's stop the voting and see how you did. And you can see that 61% of you say the answer is VDI, although we have a large number, 26%, that say the answer is VLAN. We also have single digits for IPsec, APIPA, and DDoS with 4% or 3% between those. So really, we have two options to choose from here. VDI got most of the votes. But VLAN came in at a very strong 26%. Now, the key here is that our user desktops are in the cloud. We often refer to this as desktop as a service because we are taking what would normally be on someone's computer on their desk, and we're effectively moving that computer into the cloud. The user then connects to that desktop in the cloud using some type of it's not necessarily remote control software, but it effectively is the same type of scenario. It's software specifically designed to connect to that desktop in the cloud. We often see that referred to as VDI, or Virtual Desktop Infrastructure. That was the code that we were looking for in this particular question, because you will notice that VDI was one of the proposed answers here. And indeed, that is exactly the answer we were looking for was VDI. VLAN, Virtual Local Area Networks, is a way of separating different subnets on the same switch. Has nothing really to do with desktops in a cloud-based infrastructure. Neither does IPsec, which is an exceptional VPN technology, but it doesn't help for managing desktops in the cloud. Uh, IAPIPA and DDoS are also terms that describe an automatic IP addressing. And then you've got a distributed denial of service. Both of those interesting technologies, but have nothing to do with desktops in the cloud. Uh, in this case, the desktop in the cloud would be VDI, which is certainly a type of desktop as a service. There are other types of desktop services that will run in the cloud, but the ones that we're focusing on is the VDI. It's the only option here that had anything to do with it. So that would be the right answer for this one is VDI. 61% of you got that one absolutely right. Well done. So let's do another question. We've got a troubleshooting question we can work on next. Next on our list is a user's desktop monitor flashes a black screen about every 10 seconds. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this issue? Is it because the, desk, the display is configured for the native resolution, the monitor has burn-in, brightness is set to a minimum value, the refresh rate is mismatched in the operating system, or the monitor has dead pixels? One of those has to be the right answer. If you think you know the answer, please no answering in the chat room. You instead want to go to the link on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, to lock in your answer. See if you know what this one is. Troubleshooting questions are so common on the exam. You should become very familiar with all of the troubleshooting cases that they present in the exam. So I think that's a very important part of this that you need to know what these possible troubleshooting scenarios might be. Fortunately, they tell you everything in the exam objectives. So make sure you download the exam objectives. They'll tell you what the right answer is, or they'll tell you what the possible scenarios are that you can then use to choose your right answer. And this is one of those scenarios that we want to be able to do that. Hopefully, this can give you some perspective as to what you would want to choose. Number of you have locked in your answers already. I'm going to give it another second or two. And let's step through this one. A user's desktop computer flashes a black screen about every 10 seconds. And we're assuming, of course, I guess the computer is still in one piece now uh, because it probably would not be if it kept doing that to me. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this issue? The display is configured for the native resolution. Monitor has burn-in. Brightness is set to a minimum value. The refresh rate is mismatched in the OS. 
and monitor has dead pixels. Let's see how we did with this question. We can see that 74% of the 74% of you say that the refresh rate is mismatched in the OS. We have 9% that say the display is configured for the native resolution. 7% say the monitor has burn in and 8% say the monitor has dead pixels. So those three would certainly be in a tie for second place. And then in last place, another 0% saying that brightness is set to a minimum value. 74% is pretty strong to say that maybe you have a refresh rate problem. If you have a flashing screen, which is how this is described in the CompTIA exam objectives, that flashing screen could be a number of different issues. One of the first things you probably will check is the cable itself. You ever have a bad HDMI cable and it keeps going out, it keeps going dark, and then back on again. It keeps going dark and back on again. Maybe it's a loose connection. Maybe it's a cable problem. And we have to replace the cable to resolve that because the screen keeps going black. That's just so annoying when it does that. It keeps blacking. I'm, I'm trying to read. Oh, now it's black again. Now I'm trying to read the screen, and it keeps going there. So replacing the cable can be a quick fix, and that's usually the problem. But it could be the monitor itself that is having the problem. Could be a hardware issue, certainly. Wasn't one of our options on this question, but cer certainly be that issue. And then you want to be sure, and this is really where this question was going, we want to check that the display settings that are configured in our operating system match the capabilities of the display that are connected. Most of the time, this isn't a big deal, because most of the time, your system is going to query the monitor. The monitor is going to tell it what type of monitor it is, and then the drivers in your operating system will make sure that your system is set correctly. But sometimes you just want to go in there and change a configuration. Or a user might be changing some of the settings and not realizing that some of those settings are pretty important with the video. So in this particular case, having a mismatched refresh rate can be a big problem, especially if you've told your operating system that the refresh rate is one value and the monitor thinks the refresh rate is a completely different value, you will absolutely see weirdness and blanking of screens on your monitor. It's a very, very common issue when that happens. So make sure that if you are seeing issues with the display, that you match the operating system and the monitor, that they're both configured with exactly the same parameters. Because if they are not, you'll run into a problem like this, where the issue is that it's flashing on the screen constantly. And nobody wants to go through that. You guys did really good on this. 74% is an exceptional number. Well done troubleshooting that particular problem. As you've already seen, there are so many different things you have to know for the A-plus exam. You have to know everything about hardware and networking and security and troubleshooting and cloud-based technologies and so much more. And if you start going through these videos, especially my A-plus course, it's a very concise course. I stay very specific to the exam objectives. We don't go off the beaten path. There's not a lot of dead air in my videos. They are very, very tight. But you'll still notice that there are 19 hours of videos, 137 videos in both of my courses combined. That's a lot of videos to go through. And I realize that not everybody has time to go through every single one of those. So one of the things that I've done is take all of the important information from every single video, and I put them into a series of course notes. Those course notes contain an index for every video. You've got plenty of all of the, all of the text, all of the graphics, all of the important pictures. They are in this set of course notes. So if you're somebody who is going through the process of study, I'm just going to keep going through these. They're so big. Studying for your exam and trying to get the right set of notes, this might be something that can help you as well. I've also got this in a physical form. So if you like the digital form with the PDF or you prefer something that is printed out, it's, of course, exactly the same information, but it's something that I can ship to you. And of course, if you purchase the physical edition, you get the digital edition for free. So while you're waiting on this to be delivered, you can simply download immediately that PDF version, put it on all of your mobile devices, your lo local desktop computers, anywhere you might need it so that you can get access to that information. It's also a great way to support what we do here at ProfessorMesser.com. You can find out more about this on my website or go to ProfessorMesser.com slash 1101 notes. You'll find those, of course, at ProfessorMesser.com. You'll also find them in the pull-down menus right at the top of the Professor Messer website.
Let's do another question. I've got another one here. This next question is about a port replicator. An employee is using a port replicator with their laptop computer. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this? Would it be to increase processor performance, provide additional cooling, connect additional USB devices, increase RAM capacity, or add a memory cache? Got a number of options there. An employee is using a port replicator with their laptop computer. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this? Is it to increase processor performance, provide additional cooling, connect additional USB devices, increase RAM capacity, or add a memory cache? If you think you know the answer, there's your link, professormesser.com slash QA, and lock in your answer. It's got to be one of these, right? We'll have to see what you think the answer might be. Maybe you're using a port replicator. And if you're using a port replicator, are you using it for one of these reasons? We'll find out in just a moment. A lot of you have already locked in your answers very, very quickly on this one. Makes me think it's another gimme. Makes me think maybe you know this one very well. Let's see how you did. Uh, an employee is using a port replicator with their laptop computer. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this? Is this to increase processor performance? provide additional cooling, connect additional USB devices, increase RAM capacity, or add a memory cache. How did you do with this one? And the answers are coming in with 91% of you saying it's to connect additional USB devices. And amazingly, 91%. That is a great number to have on this for port replicators, probably because a lot of us have used these before. This is one where if you're ever in the, the scenario where you are plugging into one of these port replicators, you're trying to get additional interfaces. Certainly not the only way to do this, but if you are taking a laptop from work to home and then back again, it's kind of nice to only have to plug in one thing to the port replicator, which is these days usually a USB connection. And then all of these other interfaces are simply connected at that point. It makes it very easy and very convenient to be able to move that laptop computer from one place to the other. So very useful. It's not This is another type of port replicator. There you go, a limited number of ports. But you plug in the USB, and now you have a couple of USB-C ports. There's another video output, which is not common on a port replicator. We've also got Ethernet connections, it appears, on here, and some additional USB Type A's are on there as well. So connecting additional USB devices is a perfect reason to be plugging in a port replicator. Certainly not the only reason, but it's something that can help you if you need just a couple of extra interfaces or you need a very quick way to plug in and unplug a laptop computer when you bring it into the office. Uh, certainly one that you've probably seen before, and indeed 91% of you got that one absolutely correct. Now let's move off to a networking question. Uh, this is a question that comes up often when we start talking about the A-plus exam, certainly the core one exam, because port numbers are part of the core one exam. And this question is asking about those. It asks, a network administrator needs to allow Windows file shares to pass through a firewall. Which of the following ports should be opened on the firewall? Would that be TCP 3389? TCP 443, UDP 161, TCP 445, or TCP 22. I should have put a slash there. I missed a slash. TCP 22 should have a slash there. But those are all port numbers that you should know for your exam. So the first thing I'll tell you is to first choose the right port number. The second thing I'll tell you is that you should be able to look at all five of these port numbers and tell me what these are for. You should be able to describe these to someone else and say, oh, port 3389 is for this protocol, and here's what we would use it for. So it's more than just the name of the protocol, because you'll notice the question doesn't even talk about protocols. It just talks about performing a particular function, being able to do something on the network. What would you enable to be able to do that? So hopefully this is going to be an important part of this in figuring it out. Uh, a, a number of you locking in your answers on this one, not quite as many locking it in 
as we did on the last one. We might not get 90% on this one, but we got a lot of good options here to choose from. We need to step through each one of these to figure out the details. Uh, all of these port numbers you need to know, and of course, there are many other port numbers you need to know. Make sure you go to the exam objectives and look through all of those. They, there's a possibility any of those port numbers could come up on your exam. And now that we've gone through this process, I didn't even put up my link. We pretty much, I think you've figured it out at this point. You go to professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. This question again asks, a network administrator needs to allow Windows file shares to pass through a firewall. Which of the following ports should be opened on the firewall? Would that be TCP 3389? TCP 443, UDP 161, TCP 445, or TCP 22. And for us, oh, we're all over the place. We we definitely did not get a 90% on this one. We did get a clear winner. 32% of you say the answer is TCP 45. We have a two-way tie for second place between TCP 443 with 24% and TCP 22 with also 24%. And then finally, in last place, we also have a tie between TCP 3389 with 9% and UDP 161 with 8%. So you have a number of different options here to choose from. If we go with, we did not get a majority on this one, but we did get a plurality of the answers in as TCP 445. So 32.49% if we wanted to break all of you up into uh, hundredths places of a percent, that's incredibly important, would tell me that the answer is TCP 445 because you were probably running server message block. Whenever you see a question that talks about being able to print with Windows across the network, being able to connect to a file share across a Windows network, then you're probably referring to server message block or SMB. This is the protocol or the language that Microsoft uses to have all of those Microsoft devices be able to send information back and forth to each other using the integrated capabilities of the operating system. You don't need an FTP server. You don't need a TFTP server. You don't need an, an FTPS server, an SFTP server. You don't need any extra servers. It's built into the operating system. But that built-in protocol inside of Windows is referred to as server message block, like a big block of cheese that we happen to have here. Earlier versions of Windows did not have its own uh, built-in direct communication. Instead, it used an additional protocol to piggyback this information. And that additional protocol is NetBIOS. So you might see UDP 137, UDP 139, and others used to describe that. But when we're talking about really any modern version of Windows, Windows communicates directly between each other using TCP. And the port number used to directly communicate between all of these different Windows devices is TCP port 445. Got rid of that NetBIOS a number of different Windows versions ago. You may still see those protocols still used. If you did a packet capture on your corporate network, you might still see UDP 137 or TCP 139 out there. But I would bet most of what you would see from a Windows transferring a file is probably going to be TCP 445. And that indeed would be the right answer for us. And you can see the 32% of you that answered that did get it absolutely correct. We do have TCP 443. That is, of course, used by SSH. Or for the more uh, refined uh, folks out there, it would be TLS. Uh, I still use SSH. It's so much easier to say. SSH, SSH. Much faster to say than TLS. Doesn't have, doesn't have the same ring, but effectively, we do mean the same thing when we describe that. Although, of course, hardly anybody's using uh, the SSL. Did I say SSL? SSL to this, for this. Don't, don't listen to me talk about what it isn't. Know what it is. I think that's it. And the, the chat room's so good at telling me, no, you dummy, it's not SSH, it's SSL. SSL. Uh, in any case, the TCP 443 used by SSL is a very common protocol. In fact, it will probably be one of the most common protocols you will see on your network. So you'll see a lot of TCP 443 using SSL or TLS. Thank you, chat room, for keeping me straight. TCP 22, which is the one I was jumping ahead to, 24% of you the same number. TCP 22, of course, used by, this isn't going to be confusing at all, SSH. 
SSH was the one that's TCP port 22. So between SSL and SSH, you did get a big chunk. Almost half of you chose one of those two protocols, but neither of those is used for Windows to transfer any file share information. And then we have at the top TCP port 3389, which of course is remote desktop. The RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol, very commonly uses port 3389. I was for a moment trying to going to think I was going to be cheeky with that, but we're not going to do it because I think I'm confusing enough people with the answer to this question. Instead, let's focus on the right answer, which indeed was TCP port 445 used by uh, direct SMB server message block. I'm not losing it. It's simply a live stream, which as for those of you that have been here before, you know that's pretty common. That is the right answer. If you answered TCP 445, you got it absolutely correct. Let's shift gears and go to a question that maybe is not quite as complicated in my answers and, and be able to work through all of these. This next question asks this information. A manager would like to prevent the inadvertent sharing of sensitive information from the shared laser printer output tray. Which of the following would provide this functionality? Would that be secure printing, password protected printer shares, virtual private networking, cloud printing, or audit logs? I think this one I can probably describe without confusing too many people. A manager would like to prevent the inadvertent sharing of sensitive information from the shared laser printer output tray. Which of the following would provide this functionality? Would it be secure printing, password protected printer shares, virtual private networking, cloud printing, or audit logs? If you think you know the answer, go to professormester.com slash QA and lock in your answer. See if you know what this one happens to be. This is a very specific question that covers a very specific and perhaps even a more obvious security issue. So this is certainly an important consideration if you are in really any office environment, but perhaps even more so if this is one where you're dealing with very sensitive information. I think I've, I've said too much already. I'll let you answer the question. Most of you have locked in your answers already to figure this out. Let's see if you know what this answer is. The question asks, a manager would like to prevent the inadvertent sharing of sensitive information from the shared laser printer output tray. Which of the following would provide this functionality? Would it be secure printing, password protected printer shares, not sure why I typed that in, virtual private networking, cloud printing, or audit logs? And let's see how you answered this one. This is a a question about a topic that was added to the 2-2011-01. We have 50% of you say the answer is password protected printer shares. Then we have 42% of you that say secure printing. And really, it's between those two. Everybody else is 3% for audit logs, 2% for virtual private networking, and less than a percent for cloud printing. What? The cloud? Everything's in the cloud, isn't it? Shouldn't that be the right answer that we would go with? So our scenario here, and you've probably seen this before in your workplace, you go by the printer, and there's a stack of output on the top of the printer. And usually there is a separate uh, container next to it, maybe a place where people take the stuff off of the printer and they put it there while they're waiting on their output to come out. But in the meantime, 10 or 12 or 20 different types of output are here that no one's come by to pick up, there could be anything on this paper. It could be a list of customer information. It could be the list of what everybody gets paid in your company. It could be a list of uh, security features associated with things. So this is the real important part of this is how do you protect someone from walking by, grabbing the output off the laser printer, and now having access to this very sensitive information. This is a, a significant problem. It has caused issues in other companies. And so in this case, we really do want to be sure that nobody can walk by and take sensitive information off of the, the computer. One of the ways that you might want to consider doing this is by using something like an audit log to see who is printing. So you can at least see who's sending this information. You come by the printer and thinking, there's sensitive information here. 
I can look in the audit logs to see who printed this. And that's certainly important so that you can go back to that person and tell them, maybe you shouldn't print that information so that people could see it on the printer. But that doesn't stop the problem. It simply helps you maybe redirect some of the effort. Instead, what you may want to do is use secure prints. This is a feature inside of Windows, if your printer supports it, that allows you to set a personal identification number on the printing output itself. This is one that's used with a printer from Xerox. But many printers support this. So you could give it a personal identification number, and it does. when you go to the printer, it's not printed out yet. Instead, the printer has an option to put in the personal identification number. You type that in, and it starts printing right then as you're standing in front of the printer. That way, no one else can get access to that output. The printouts come out, you grab your output, and you're on your way, and nobody has access to that sensitive information. Another good option here that would have been something you can use, here's another version of this inside of the, the printer properties itself, where you can turn the pin protected printing on and then add your favorite personal identification number to the list uh, and have those there. And there will probably be an option on the screen of the printer where it tells you, oh, you can punch in your personal identification number here, and then it will provide the output on the printer itself so that you can print it. Now, there's another capability that is in the exam objectives that you should know about that's very similar to this called badging. Some printers will have a badge reader on the printer itself, and nothing prints regardless of how you set up a print. Uh, the print driver or the printer properties, nothing prints on this printer until you show up at the printer and use your ID badge or your security badge to badge into the printer. And only then does it print out your output, and then you can take it back to your desk. So that's another very similar way to provide that function. It's referred to in the exam objectives as badging. So if you see that when it's referencing printers, that's what they mean, is you're using your badge to be able to effectively unlock the printing process. That means in our particular case, the answer that we were looking for was secure printing. And 42% of you did choose that as your option. That is the correct answer. It is secure printing. And that is the one way that we could prevent inadvertently sharing sensitive information from the laser printer output tray. If you ever get into security, you're doing anything with security in your companies. This is one of the major things you'll want to look at is that information leakage through things like leaving a printout on top of the printer itself. The, the majority of you chose, though, 50% of you chose password-protected printer shares. Now, why wouldn't that be the right answer? Well, if you've ever printed to a password-protected printer, it, it prompts you whenever you try to print to that printer and says, hold on. You're sending me output, but you're not allowed to send that unless you're one of the authorized users of this printer. So put in your username and password. Oh, OK, here's my username. Here's my password. Go. OK, you've been authenticated. You are a proper user for this printer. And we'll accept your printer, right, printer output right now. And we're printing it. So that doesn't stop someone from now going by and having a look at the output. It only stops people from printing to a printer. It doesn't stop people from managing what's on top of the printer itself. So ultimately, you still have the output on the printer. If you're password protecting the printer shares, you're not preventing someone from walking by and grabbing that output and having a look at everybody's pay, uh, pay grades and pay information that was printed out by HR that was for a meeting later on that they forgot they printed and left on the printer. This happens all the time. So in this case, it would not be password-protected printer shares. That's not going to help you. Virtual private networking is great for protecting information being sent over the network. We we'll often refer to this as printing or communicating over an encrypted tunnel. But that doesn't stop someone from walking up to the printer and grabbing the output. Cloud printing, similar problem. We can print to the cloud. Eventually, it's going to print to a printer from the cloud. And of course, at that point, someone can walk by and take the output. That doesn't help us. And then as I mentioned, audit logs can be useful for finding who may be printing to the printer, but it doesn't stop the output from sitting on top of the printer and being susceptible to someone walking by and grabbing all of that output. The answer here, the one we were looking for, was indeed secure printing. That's what we were hoping to find. And 42% of you got that one absolutely correct.
If you are watching this video for continuing education unit credit, I would love to send you an email that certifies that you watch this and you have earned one hour of a webinar category CEU. You must send or follow these instructions for me to be able to send you this email. And you must receive this email if you're watching this after the fact and you want to be able to put in uh, some type of verification that you were here and watching this live stream. So what you would do is go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. There is a Contact Us link on that page. Click Contact Us. It'll bring up a form. In that form, put your name, your email address. In the subject line, please put January 2024 Core 1 or A plus or something that tells me which one of these live streams it is. And then in the body of the message, on a line by itself, put the super secret code words of the month, secure printing. Secure printing are the super secret code words of the month. And then, of course, you can put anything else into that message that you would like. I read through every single one of these. Or you can just leave it there. You can just put secure printing. I get your email. I know what to do with it. I will then send you back an email that has been digitally signed that certifies that you were here to watch a one hour webinar category CEU. There you go. So that's how you would do it again. The top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website, click the contact us link. Uh, from that contact us link, put your name, your email address in the subject line, put January 2024 core one and the body of the message we're looking for are super secret code words, secure printing. Usually it takes me about a week to turn these around and get them back to you. Sometimes it takes a little longer. Sometimes it takes a little faster to, to get it to you, but it will get to you eventually, I promise. We'll make sure that we're able to make that happen. So we'll see how we do with those and be able to work through the details of these. Let's do another question. I have more for you. We're not done yet. Uh, this next question on our list asks, the VT functionality has been administratively disabled on a user's workstation. Which of the following would be affected? Would that be encrypted web communication, multi-channel memory, external USB storage, network printing, or virtual machines. The VT functionality has been administratively disabled on a user's workstation. Which of the following would be affected? Would it be encrypted web communication, multi-channel memory, external USB storage, network printing, or virtual machines? If you think you know the answer, please no answers in the chat room. Instead, you want to go to professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. See if you happen to know what this answer might be. This might be a good one to, to work through. Certainly, it is a technology you need to know for your exam. It's technology from the exam objectives. And so we have to know what it's used for. And this would be a good way to tell if we do happen to know what it happens to be used for. Let's see how you do with this one. Lock in your answer by visiting professormesser.com slash QA. Or you can, of course, use the VVox app content that you see on the left side of the screen. Let's see if you, all of these things, of course, are things that we want to worry about or things that can certainly be an issue. So we will certainly work our way around uh, what all of these might be. But certainly all of these are a concern uh, or a concern. We need to work through what those would be. Let's see how you did with this one. The question again asks, the VT functionality has been administratively disabled on a user's workstation. Which of the following would be affected? Would it be encrypted web communication, multi-channel memory, external USB storage, network printing, or virtual machines? Let's see what you answered. We'll stop our polling, and we can see that 84%, a huge number, 84% is pretty big that you say the answer is virtual machines. But is this one of these scenarios where we all chose one thing and it's something else? We'll find out in a moment. Uh, encrypted web communication is 7%. And then we have effectively a three-way tie for third place between multi-channel memory, external USB storage, and network printing with anywhere between 1% to 3% in each one of those. So the real question, of course, deals with VT and understanding what VT happens to be. If you're someone who is looking through the BIOS of your computer and you happen to be using an Intel CPU, you may find that the Intel CPU has a function available in it called 
the VT support. And that VT stands for, quite literally, virtualization technology. If you're running an AMD processor, the technology is similar, but it's name different, like everything else on the Intel slash AMD side. AMD refers to it as AMD V, the V being, of course, for virtualization. That's right. I had to had to think about that one for a moment. Uh, it's all dealing with virtualization. That's what that capability does because you can enable specific virtualization capabilities in the hardware of your processor. It not only makes your virtualization much faster and much more performs much better if you're virtualizing. In some cases, it's required for certain types of software to be able to perform this virtualization. And that's why such a large percentage of you chose virtual machines. That is the right answer. That's what we were looking for because that's what VT enables or disables is the virtualization capabilities. And that's something we definitely need to be aware of if we are planning to set up a hypervisor or some type of desktop virtualization software on our local computer you may get an error message saying your VT is not enabled, your AMD V is not enabled. You now need to go into this list and be able to resolve that particular issue, which in most cases involves going through the BIOS configuration, enabling that capability, rebooting your computer, and now trying that functionality again. And I'll bet you'll be just fine. But 84% of you knew that would be the case. And that's why you chose virtual machines. That is the right answer. Encrypted web communication is something that is managed in your browser, it's something that's normally available using what protocol again? Oh, that's right, SSL, not SSH, uh, SSL or TLS, as many people will properly use. Uh, Multi-channel memory is a capability that's usually just enabled inside of your motherboard. You just have to make sure you have the right number of memory modules to be able to use that. We also have external USB storage, uh, which is certainly handy, but it's something that you really find uh, has nothing to do with the virtualization capabilities or the VT functionality. And the same thing with network printing. I do realize, of course, that SSL is deprecated and you really don't find SSL being used anywhere. However, in our industry, we still use that term to refer to TLS. So when you're talking with someone who's a network administrator, security administrator, and you're wondering to yourself, why do they keep using the term SSL? Why aren't they using the more modern and proper term of TLS? Because that's what we've always used. We've always used SSL. And as I mentioned earlier, it sounds better. <laughs> that's why we still use it, quite honestly. SSL. We can tell somebody, oh, we're working on the SSL certificate. We're getting you an SSL certificate. We're enabling SSL decryption in our firewall. We're working through an SSL certificate problem. SSL, SSL, SSL. We do that all the time. We hardly ever say we're working through a TLS certificate problem. We're setting up TLS de de decryption on our firewall. I can't even say it. That's how difficult it is to be able to step through that particular acronym. So it's true, we did improve SSL by getting rid of it and creating a newer, better version of it that we now call TLS. We just forgot to tell ourselves that it has a different acronym. And that's why. Uh, just SSL is something you will commonly see. So don't be thrown when somebody says SSL. Just know in your mind, oh, they're referring to TLS. And everybody is just fine. And that's that will never change. It's not really it's not really people who have done this a long time. It's just how we say it in the industry. Everybody does that. And then we get to, of course, uh, get to the point where at least we know where to go with this particular problem. We know that it is an encryption problem dealing with a web server. Someone says SSL, just assume they really do mean TLS because they really do. And they know that. We all know SSL is no longer used anymore. So that's my little SSL TLS conversation about that. Well, that gives us a place to go. At least when we start looking at problems and challenges with answering some of these questions, it's important. Now, I know we're at the top of the hour, but let's go through another question that I have for you. This next question on our list, we're going to deviate just a little bit because there is a set of questions that I have already written for this exam. This exam is the 2201101. And I, when I started looking around the internet at practice exams and practice questions, one of the things that I find is perhaps disheartening is that there's such a lack of really good practice questions on this particular exam. 
Um, a lot of the questions I see online are also outdated that have answers or questions themselves that are referring to topics that aren't even covered on the exam anymore. And there's really no excuse for that because the exam objectives are free and available to everyone. So I wrote a set of practice exams that first have the same tone, the same feel, the same flavor as the questions on the actual exam. And I guarantee you that in this book, all of the topics you're going to cover are topics that come from the exam objectives. You're not going to find information in here that's out of date because I make sure to update it every time there is a new exam. Every single question is updated on every single one of these. So I have for you a question from my practice exams. Let me bring this up on my screen. This is a question. And again, no answers in the chat room, please. We're going to take care of this one or go through this one the same way that we've done some of these others. This question asks, a user is just connected to a new wireless network, but they can't view any internet websites. Their network configuration shows the IP address is 169.254.228.109. The subnet mask is 225.225.0.0, and they've not been assigned a default gateway. Which of these is the most likely cause of this issue? Is it the subnet mask is not correct? The internet provider is experiencing a temporary outage? the DHCP server is down, or the wireless adapter is not working properly. We've got a number of different options there to choose from, of course. We need to step through what the problem was in this question and what the answers are. Now, this is from my practice exams book. So some of the things that you could do with this, of course, is to go through and annotate it. That's a lot of these PDF uh, uh, documents will allow you to change or highlight different parts of this. So if there's things that you feel are important here, you could certainly go through this list to be able to break those down. So this is a really good example of stepping through a question, evaluating what all the different options are, and then breaking down what you think the answers might be. Now, one of the things you'll notice here is that I'm on page 12 of this. This is question A33. But one of the other things that you'll find is that the answer, if you just want A, B, C, or D, is you can go to page 31. The details for the answer here is on page 68. Now, of course, you could scroll forward from page 12 to page 68, but I put links right in the book. So if I click the words, the details, it takes me right to the answer. So the question is at the top of the page, the same one we just looked at, and tells me the answer is C, the DHCP server is down. And it tells you why that is the right answer, which I think many practice exams on the internet will tell you why the right answer is right. But the problem is that I often don't get the answer correct. I often get the answer wrong. So I want to know why the wrong answer is wrong. So in my practice exams book, I document every single incorrect answer, and I explain to you why the incorrect answers are incorrect. I think that's a great opportunity when you're learning this material to be able to kind of bring the circle back around. So you've, you've taken a stab at the question. You've gotten it wrong. Now let's learn from getting it wrong. This is a huge opportunity. This is a great chance for learning more content. So all of the answers in my practice exams are all from the exam objectives. So it's like getting four different objectives in every single question. It's a great opportunity. And I even tell people, even if you get it right, go read the wrong answers just so you can verify that you know why it wasn't the right subnet, the subnet mass not being correct was wrong, why the internet provider having a temporary outage would not be the right answer, why the wireless adapter would not be the issue. Because the question you get on your exam may have something to do with a subnet mask. It may have something to do with an internet provider. It may have something to do with the wireless adapter. So these can help you out with those questions just by looking through the answers to one single question. And once we're through with this, of course, I can hit the back button in my PDF reader. We're back to where we started, and I can go to the next question that's on my list. This is all in my practice exams book. And just like my course notes, there's both digital versions and physical versions available. The physical version, again, if you purchase the physical version, you get the digital version for free that you can download immediately. This is all on my website. You can find out more at professormesser.com slash core1pe for more information. As I mentioned earlier, all of this comes from the exam objectives. If you don't have the exam objectives, you're doing yourself a disservice because there is a huge amount of free information in here. And when people ask me, 
what do I really need to know for the exam? This tells you everything you need to know. This is the comprehensive list that tells you everything associated with your exam. Here's a copy of the exam objectives. I'm just going to flip through it. Every bullet on here you have to know for your exam. CompTIA is one of the few organizations in the industry that gives you this level of detail when it comes to taking an exam. Cisco doesn't do this. Microsoft doesn't do this. Uh, VMware doesn't do this. Nobody else does this level of detail, it seems. Everybody uh, who is working on these exams go directly to these exam objectives. They will really help you understand what you need to know for this exam. And that way, you're covered and you know exactly what might be asked of you on the actual exam. You can get a copy of these by going to the CompTIA website. I have a link that will take you directly there if you go to professormesser.com slash objectives, or you can simply go to your favorite search engine, type in CompTIA exam objectives. The first link is going to take you right to the objective page that tells you exactly what you need to know. Well, we have one of these study groups available every month for the A+. In fact, I do two different study groups every month, one for the Core 1 and one for the Core 2. Our next Core 2 study group is in two days on January the 11th. Make sure you come back for that one. And we've got other study groups throughout the month of January. We have one on January the 17th and one on the 24th for Network Plus and our new 701 Security Plus study group on the 24th of this month. And of course, in February, the, the scheduling is a little bit different, but you can see that we have A plus, Network Plus, and Security Plus study groups also scheduled for February as well. Well, that brings us to the end of our first hour, but we're not done yet. Stick around. We've got the after show. Well, I'll take your questions. We'll step through each one of those. We can talk about technology. We can talk about career. We can talk about whatever you would like to describe. I've uh, this is a great time if you want to go to your VVox front end or visit professormesser.com slash QA. There's a tab right at the top of the screen that takes you over to the questions, and you could submit those right now. Don't forget about our vouchers. Our discounted vouchers are on our site. You can find those at professormesser.com slash vouchers. You can also find our practice exams, our course notes, and all of our study materials at professormesser.com slash 1101 success. And of course, we're on Discord, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Facebook. And to find us there, you simply type in professormesser.com slash the name of that site. So professormesser.com slash Discord gets you to our Discord. Our slash Twitter gets you to our daily pop quiz questions on Twitter. Although I'll have to say I like the ones on Instagram that come with a pretty picture. And, of course, find that at professormesser.com slash Instagram. That gets you to the information that might help you study for your exam. Hopefully that can get you where you'd like to be. But we also have much more to talk about today. Stick around for the after show. Thanks for being here in the first hour. Uh, we love doing these live streams. and It's always great when we have this Q&A and we're able to go back and forth. Plenty more to come. Stick around for that. Thanks for being here. And we'll see you next time on the A Plus Study Group. Okay, it's time for the after show, everybody. We can now shift gears a little bit and move over to the after show part of this. There's plenty of questions. The way that you can submit a question is if I bring up, I need to close out some of the things that are on my screen. If you'll bear with me one moment, we're going to close that out. So now you can see on your screen that you can except it's not that screen, is it? It's this screen. You can submit questions for the second hour of this study group at any time. You can even do it now. Uh, we'll be moderating the questions as we go through this in the session. So you'll submit them, but you may not see them pop up on your screen. You can instead, of course, have a look at uh, what we have here, and then I'll put uh, the questions as they're coming through on my side. Uh, this is a great place to go if you ever want to submit those questions. They are on the same link, which makes it easy, professormesser.com slash QA. So I'm going to go through the questions that you have submitted already. And we'll start with one where someone is, they're working right now to be able to get these questions and have them available. This is from Andre who asks, uh, Professor Messer, I'm taking my 220-1101A plus exam tomorrow. Can you give me some advice on passing the exam? Absolutely, I can. You know, one of the, the things that I run into with this exam is that there's a lot of content a lot across a lot of different areas. 
So the the suggestion I give you is the one is the last thing I mention. In fact, let's bring up the the set of exam objectives and I'll explain to you why I think these are so important. These are downloadable from the CompTIA website. They are free. They're available as a PDF. And if you look into them, let's just have a look at the first one here. For section 1.0, domain 1 on the exam is mobile devices. And you can see at the very top, it says, given a scenario, install and configure laptop hardware and components. And those include hardware slash device replacement of battery, keyboard slash keys, random access memory, or RAM, hard disk drive, HDD, solid state drive, SSD, migration. So some people would like to go to a, a spinning drive to an SSD. How do you do that? SSD slash SS, uh, HDD slash SSD replacement, wireless cards. You also have the option for physical privacy and security components, including biometrics and near field scanner features. So you want to be able to explain to yourself or to a third party what each of these bullets would involve. And that's a great way to test yourself. If you think you have explained it very well, you can check that one off your list. If maybe you think that one was a little rough, you might want to highlight it or circle it so that you can come back to that later. This is a PDF, so you can write that down, be able to see it. So plenty to go through there. And then once you get through that first section 1.1, you move off to section 1.2. I guess it would be good if I, there we go. Section 1.2, compare and contrast the display components of mobile devices, including LCD, IPS, TN, VA, OLED, et cetera, et cetera. You go through all of those bullets. I think if you've got a week left before you take your exam, this would be a very good way to be able to know what you could possibly see on your exam. Because if you know everything in the exam objectives, you're going to do fine on your exam. That's the part that is the important piece of this. Not only do you get an idea of the scope of the exam and how much of a particular topic may be covered on the exam, you also know exactly what topics are there. So uh, I mentioned a week in advance because I think that's good. A day in advance, it's a little tight, but you could still go through this list and find topics that may not be as readily knowledgeable in your brain anyway. So you can at least circle a few things and get those down before walking into your exam tomorrow. I think if you're short on time and you're working through your studies, I think that is a very, very good way to go through the process of understanding what you need to know before you walk into that room. And CompTIA effectively gives you everything you need to know. What could be better than that? Let's keep going down this list. Um, and the other things that have been brought up to these, I'm just going to sort of scan through these and we'll, we'll bring them up and put them up on our screen. Um, let's have a look at, this is a, this is a common question I get. And I think it's, it's one where we should probably think about the market itself and what's going on. The question asks, I've been applying for help desk and technician jobs for a month now after getting the A plus, but no luck so far. Is the job market in IT not doing well these days? I think overall, the the economy is not doing great these days, but it's not awful. It's not as, as bad and dire, I think, as some people would like to make it out to be. I'll also say that from uh, the idea of putting in a job, uh, applying for jobs and putting your resumes for help desk and technician jobs, you're doing exactly the right thing. But I would also say, and, and I don't mean this flippantly, although it kind of sounds like it in my head, you've only been doing it for a month. <laughs> so that ideally, we'd be able to find a job right out of the gate. We get the phone calls as soon as they get our resume. How could they not call us? Our resume was amazing. They should, we've got certifications. They should be calling. I should, my voicemail should be full. I'm not getting the calls. But these things do take time. Companies tend to do this um, when they're looking for new people. They tend to do it when new projects are starting up. When the economy is slower, it's slower to get some of these new projects. Sometimes they have people that leave an organization. So maybe they might add one seat uh, to fill in that attrition, but that's only one single seat and you're competing against a lot of people for that single seat. It can be a challenge. But anytime you're in the job market, this is the challenge. It's not about the market these days. It's really not about the economy right now. Everybody needs technologists. That's one thing we at least discovered during our shutdown during the pandemic. It's suddenly technologists had a lot of work to do. 
we had jobs during that time frame because we had to set up everybody at home. We had to work on our VPNs. We had to get new licensing. We had to make sure that our applications could be used remotely. We had to get people new hardware. We had a lot of work to do. And the same thing applies pretty much at any other time. I've gone through good times with the economy and bad times with the economy, but we're still hiring technologists all the time, sometimes more than others. So there is a point to be made there, certainly. But you've only been in this a month. Keep doing what you're doing. But there may be things you can do beyond the scope of simply throwing in resumes and hoping that they stick. You may want to build out your own home lab and plug things into your home lab so that you can describe the process of setting up an Active Directory infrastructure, so that you can describe plugging in a firewall and setting firewall rules and identifying alerts that are coming across on your IPS. You know, all of these are interesting labs that you could do in your home lab that have a practical example of real-world technology that's used in some of the biggest companies in the world. Firewall that you have at home is very similar to the firewall that's in a huge corporate Fortune 100 environment. The only difference is that in the Fortune 100 environment, the firewalls are much bigger and they go much faster. But effectively, the front end, the rule base, the configuration settings are identical to what you would use at home. Very good example. I'm, as many of you know, I am a former Palo Alto Network Systems engineer. I spent years working with their amazing next generation firewalls, understanding everything that I needed to know about using those technologies. And it's true, we had firewalls that were that were this big. They were very tiny firewalls you could run at a small office or in a home, and they were very small. And then we had firewalls that were enormous 19-inch racks that had cards you could slide into them, traditional, very large-scale infrastructure firewalls. The user interface on both of those was identical. The configuration process, identical. The, uh, uh, the setup for the security rules, the firewall rules themselves inside the firewall, identical. They were exactly the same. So setting up these at home give you a very good feel to the type of setup that you would do in an infrastructure, in a very large scale infrastructure, in a very large environment. So those are some skills to be able to do. So grab one of the open source firewalls that's out there. Go grab PFSense. There's a good example of an, is PFSense still open source? There's There's been a lot of things happening in the open source firewall market over the last two years, by the way. So um, uh, there, was an, there was a few open source firewalls that went more to a closed model. But I think PFSense is still open source, last I checked anyway. If not, go find an open source firewall that you like, that you can install and start using. Um, the real benefit there is not just saying that you can put on your resume knowledgeable in PFSense. The re I find the real value is when you finally get in front of someone in an interview and they say, tell me about a challenging problem you had to resolve. You can talk for 15 minutes about setting up PFSense, about the problems you had getting it running, how you solve those problems to get it running, and then perhaps even more importantly, what you saw once it was running. And this is something that works for every firewall you will run into. When you plug in a firewall for the first time or any type of monitoring software, you will be shocked at something you see on the network. Of all of the companies that I ever visited, and I visited hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies and plugged into their networks and, and showed them the capabilities of the firewalls that I was, I was representing, in every single one of those examples except one, did we see something pop up that made people go, what? That's on our network? Every single time that happened except once. And it was a network that they had just turned on. Very few people were on the network. Nobody had a chance to do anything naughty yet. Nobody had a chance to set up any software they had not been authorized to use yet. So that one was not great. Uh, that was not a great demo. It was more like if there was something to see, you would see it here. Uh, that was the only time I had to do that. For the rest, of, for the years and years of time, for the seven or so years that I worked there, every single time I plug into a network, there was an interesting story. Imagine bringing those stories to your interview. That's what the person interviewing you wants to hear is those stories. So whether you're setting up a, a configuration for Active Directory, you're building your own Active Directory infrastructure at home, which you can do. 
Very easy to do. Plenty of YouTube videos on how to do that. You're setting up your own firewall. You're setting up your own IPS. Maybe you're setting up, once you get those running, you're setting up a monitoring station so you can monitor the firewall. Maybe you take the logs and send them to a SIM. There's a lot of open source SIMs that you could use. That's an SEIM that you would use, although SIM is also used with this as well. Security, event, and information uh, management tool. Those are great ways to set up uh, something where you can do more than just present a resume. And then, of course, there's lots of things that you might want to look at on your resume about how the information is being presented, about the credentials that you have, about highlighting what you know, and highlighting what the hiring manager wants to hire. One of the things that's in the YouTube video description of this video are links to a couple of videos I did about why your resume keeps getting rejected. The first is five reasons why your resume keeps getting rejected. And the second video is five more reasons why your resume keeps getting rejected. And I talk in there about things you can use to optimize your resume and uh, optimize what's being presented to the people reading your resume because people really do read your resumes. So even things to the level of understanding what do you put on a cover letter is important. Uh, and are you not? Are you using a cover letter? You're not using a cover letter already. You, you're at a disadvantage. Oh, if you're using a cover letter, you could still be at a disadvantage because as a, I used to be a hiring manager, I know, don't look at me that way. I did. I got out of it. I'm good. I went back to technology. But as a hiring manager, I had to look through a lot of resumes and a lot of, of cover letters say, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to apply for this very important position. As a technologist, I pride myself in being knowledgeable with today's most advanced technologies. Thanks again for this opportunity. Signed, this person. It was a waste of space. The cover letter is an opportunity for you to tell the potential employer, here's why you should hire me. And I have a T style, T, letter T, a T style cover letter format, which I think is optimal for the things that we do in technology. You should look into that as well. Those are a couple of things you may want to consider if you're having challenges on the job hunt uh, that might give you some ideas of things you can do and things you can prepare for. Uh, and I thank you very much for that particular question. Let's get some more questions uh, that you work here. Uh, this is more of a question with our vouchers on our side. I mentioned we have our discounted vouchers on professormaster.com slash vouchers. Uh, this one says, Reese properly says, uh, mate, why does your discounted company of vouchers not work outside of America slash Canada like in the UK? He didn't say mate. I, I added that because he said UK. But Reese, Reese knows uh, that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the vouchers on my site only work if you're in the U.S., Canada, or U.S. territory. Uh, they don't work in other countries, at least not yet or not in a way that I've been able to make this work. Um, there's a number of different challenges on my side, most of them dealing with uh, finding the right uh, way to manage the, the, the monies. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but over in the UK, you have a completely different form of currency. You, you almost talk different, too. I, we should have a communication. We, sh we should have a conversation about that. But you use a completely different form of cash. That, that doesn't help me. Um, it complicates things quite a bit. Um, so going from dollars to pounds and somehow getting those pounds back to me is a little bit of a logistics problem, legal problem, tax problem. And I have kind of worked through the best way to deal with this. Um, and I think it would be great, but currently it's true. I don't support having um, vouchers um, that can be used in places other than the U.S. or Canada. All I can do now is apologize for that. I do apologize for that. I would love to be able to provide vouchers for everybody in the world. I just need to find a better way to do it. But it, it is on my list, as as telling as that is, it's been on the list for a while. But I, I am still looking at that, and I would like to resolve it. I'm trying to find good ways to make that happen. I'm, I'm coming up with a couple of those, but we'll figure it out. We'll make this happen. Uh, other questions that you have submitted. Again, you can submit questions at any time using the link on your screen. Simply go to professormesser.com slash QA and send your question in that way. Um, let's go through a couple of others that are on this list. Um, 
This is one that has come up in the chat room. It has nothing to do with A+, but it certainly has to do with questions. Uh, Reese asks, when are you publishing? When, sir? When, kind sir, are you publishing? The I'm putting a lot on Reese here. Are you publishing the CompTIA Security Plus 701 practice exam questions? This, uh, Reese, is probably the most popular question that I've gotten this, this week, past week or so. Uh, for those of you not familiar, the Security Plus exam had a new version released. The SY0701 was released in November on the 7th. So it's been out for a couple of months now. We're at the very beginnings of this. And of course, it's going to be out for another three and a half years after this. And whenever we have a new version of an exam come out, I create a new set of videos. I create new course notes. I create new audio. I create new video downloads. I create and I create new practice exams books. But the books are, are big. Um, it's a lot to go through. As you already saw, one question has not just the question, the answers, and the explanation of the right answer. It also has the explanation of the wrong answers. In fact, I didn't even show you in the book. Once you're through the question and looking at the details at the very bottom, I even put a link to the video that describes where the question came from. So every time there's a new exam, all of those have to be updated to content that corresponds to the latest Security Plus. But you may be thinking to yourself, but wait, Professor, it's simply moving from the 601 exam to the 701 exam. How, how different could this possibly be? Why is this taking you so long? Would you please get to work already? And I, I can only agree with you. You're absolutely correct that it I should be working on this right now, but for some reason I'm doing this live stream. But the, the first part of that was the question of what has changed between those two exams. And the answer is a lot. Um, the 601 exam, let me see if I can move my head down here so we can see this a little better. The 601 exam had 1,034 objectives. If you counted every bullet that was in the exam objectives, by my counting, which is not an exact counting if you were to do this, but you would get close to just over, let's say, a thousand objectives. That is this big yellow circle in my Venn diagram. The 701 exam, if you were to count the number of objectives, have 662 objectives. It's a much smaller circle uh, by about 430 so or 200, uh, 200 to 300, depending on how you count, 200, 300 different uh uh, changes, sometimes a little more than that, sometimes a little less, but it's pretty close. That's the number I got was 662. So you can see the 701 exam overall, a little smaller than the 601. The other part that's interesting is that 324 of the objectives are the same between the two. That's this middle part of the Venn diagram. But notice that 710 of the objectives on the 601 don't even appear on the 701. All of these were dropped. Now, imagine you wrote a book for the yellow. Now, now you have to update the book. Now throw out 60, throw out 70% of the book. Just throw it out. So I have to write 70% of the book back. And I have to update things that were changed in both of those. And so we have 300, we have about 50% of the 701 exam is new content, 50% of the 701 exam is old content, and then everything that was old in the 601 was thrown out over here. So that's why there's no book yet. But the good part is the writing of the book is going exceptionally well, much better than I was expecting. So it's going along quite nicely at this point. We've still got a lot of work to do to write these questions up because I write every single one of these questions. I write them with the same flavor of the actual exam, and I make sure that every single question has content that is related back to the most current version of the exam objectives. I would probably argue that this is perhaps one of the most comprehensive and accurate sets of practice exams that you will find for these CompTIA exams, because I wrote them that way. Um, that is um, why this takes much longer. So I appreciate, by the way, you asking about it, and thank you for doing that. Um, it probably, over the coming months, you will see that that practice exams book will be made available, but 
rest assured, we're working on it. We know you'd like to see it. I want to have it out and running. So don't worry, we'll get it out to you. And it will be really, really good when you get it. I'm so happy with what we've written so far. I'm extremely pleased with how it's turning out. We just need to work a little bit more and, and make sure that it, it's something you will like. Uh, the good stuff takes time to be able to create. The, the bad stuff, they throw out there any time. But um, this, is, this is coming along nicely, and we'll get you a 701 book very shortly. Do not worry and make that happen. Uh, other questions. Let's keep going through this list, um, being able to work through these. Um, this is, we'll talk more of a career question. We did a career question earlier about posting a job. Uh, this is from Nate who asks, do you know of any good places to apply for jobs or any good place to network for job opportunities? Yes, I do, because we would do this all the time uh, and being able to make that happen. The, the idea of applying for jobs is a, it's a challenge. Um, there's so many different places you have to go to just find the job postings. You have to go to the company's website directly. You can go to indeed.com. You can go to LinkedIn jobs. You can go to, and one of many other online job posting websites, and you can post jobs on those job posting websites. Um, that can be a little iffy because you don't know if your resume is really going to get in front of the right people. You don't know if they're really going to read through it. Very often, these resumes, of course, are evaluated uh, through automation where they look for certain keywords on your resume. And if your resume doesn't have enough of those keywords, they just put it in the, disc, in the bin and send you a note that says, sorry, you don't qualify for this job. Done. Uh, but maybe you go out to Dice.com, you go out to Indeed, you go out to LinkedIn Jobs, and you see a number of jobs like that, that may be what happens with those. Now, sometimes those will hit. Sometimes you'll have someone call you or contact you about a job posting that you put on there because ultimately those resumes do get back to the HR department or to the hiring manager. One of the things I think that is important, though, is is knowing how to get around that limitation because doing that online is is just the worst possible percentage of success. What you want are other ways to get in front of a hiring manager. And I think there are a number of ways to do this. One of the things you mentioned, Nate, was networking. And I know you weren't referring to computer networking. You were referring to people networking, and that is very important. So in your area, wherever you happen to be in your, geograph your geographical location, you're hopefully near a large city. And I would expect in most large cities, from what I have found, there are many opportunities to network with other professionals. And I highly recommend you do this. Have a look for a Microsoft user group meeting in your area. Have a look for a Cisco user group meeting in your area. A Palo Alto Networks user group meeting in your area. Sign up for those. Go to those meetings. Go meet the people in these meetings. Don't just go to the meeting and sit in the back, and when they bring out the pizza, you sneak out and go home. You're there to meet people, and you should have some questions for meeting people. This is, this is a challenge we all have, by the way, is being social. Uh, there are few, I, I, in my opinion, there are very few people that are naturally social. I think most of us are antisocial. If, if you aren't sure about that statement, go rewind back to the pandemic. <laughs> we were super non-social. We were really good at it. You have to have questions you can ask. So when you meet people there and you're at this event, there will be a time where you all get to mingle. Maybe it's before the event, maybe it's after, but you can ask people they probably have a badge on. Hi, hi, Larry. Great to meet you. I haven't been to one of these before. Have you been to one of these events? Do you go to the user group, the Microsoft user group meeting every month? Oh, you do. Oh, we, are you, do you work now as a system administrator? Oh, you do. At which company? Oh, you're at, at Acme. Oh, that could, they got a huge building right off the interstate. Is that where you work over there? That place is, is something. Uh, I'm in the process of looking for a job. Do you guys do... Uh, do you hand in or have uh, referral bonuses at Acme? Oh, you do. Would you like my resume so that you can hand it into HR just in case they happen to hire me? You can make some money off of me coming to this Microsoft user group meeting. Wouldn't that be great? Well, I'll send it to you here. We'll do it right now. I'll send it there. Click, click. There you go. You've now got my resume. Feel free to put it in there. 
Um, the important part with that is you've now created these connections with the people that are at these user group meetings. You'll see them next month at the user group meeting. And if you happen to be called by Acme to come in for a meeting to talk about a potential job posting, a placement, then you could say, oh, yeah, I know Larry from the user group meeting. That's where I met him. He told me all about this project you guys were working on with the imaging and how important it is for the next year. It sounded fascinating. You know, those little tidbits that you can gather from folks and drop into the meetings can be incredibly valuable. So go to the, plus the user group meetings, by the way, they're showing the latest technologies. You're learning about Cisco. You're learning about Microsoft. You're learning about Palo Alto Networks. You're learning about Checkpoint. You're learning about all these companies. Go to those meetings and learn about the technology and meet the people. One of the things I, I have found through my career in IT, and I have worked in IT with corporate in Miami. I've worked with uh, large uh, multinational companies in Silicon Valley in California. I've worked in other uh, other VARs and and challenging uh, type of positions in other ways as systems engineers. In all of these, the real challenge that I've always found is getting in front of them to say, here's my capabilities. So having and knowing people that already work there, incredibly valuable. Having a story about how you've worked with that person or your relationship with this person as it relates to something technical is also valuable. So go to these user group meetings. Now, another thing you might want to look for in your area is, um, I don't know how often they do them these days. There used to be a slew of these that would come out, and I see one every once in a while, but there are other organizations that will do trade shows. Um, and sometimes they're more of a regional trade show. So they're not like the, the interops of old that we used to have, where it would be an enormous... A uh, city-wide, very large Las Vegas-style trade show. It's more of a small uh, high school gym-sized trade show, but still the local people are there. So that's another great place to meet people and learn about technology. So check out what SANS might be doing. That's S-A-N-S. -S. Find out what they're doing in your in your geography. I think they're doing a number of trade shows slash training slash conventions around the world over this next year. So we've got a lot of different options for going out and finding people that like the same things we like and that are hiring for the jobs that we would like to be hired for. Um, those are just some of the networking examples I can think of. Um, a good example Candace even mentions in the chat room, go to Meetup. Uh, Meetup has great, the Meetup website has a great list of different events that might be in your area. And you can find the IT events very, very easily in those. Those are great places to network and that might give you a heads up. In fact, I I think there may be a couple of, of events that are coming to an uh, area near me soon. And I wanna be sure that I can go to those trade shows because I like to see the latest technologies too. I gotta, I gotta get out of here. This is this tiny little room, it's dark. I, I need to find out what's going on in the world. That's how I do it too, is find out what these people that I know are working on. And I used to have a job presenting at these trade shows. I used to have a job going to these Palo Alto Networks user group meetings and hosting them. So I know the people that show up at these meetings because I used to talk to them all the time. And it's a great place to meet folks and learn more about the people in your industry. One of the things you'll notice also is when you meet people in your local area, all we tend to do is move to the other com companies that are in our local area. So where someone might be today, they might be at a different company later. They're down the street at a different organization. But you'd start to learn where everybody is. And it's as they say, it's a small world, but I wouldn't want to paint it. But it, it is a small world. And it's a small core group. I say core group, but it's a very large group of technologists that are in your area. But you get to know them and recognize them. Oh, where are you these days? Oh, where are you working? Let me get on your LinkedIn. Let's keep track of each other. Have you got a copy of my resume? It's a great way to network, and we all work together to make that happen. So feel free to, to have a look at those. That's an important thing to consider. It's an important step in your career. Um, one of the things I always tell people is get your LinkedIn set up now and continue to, uh, to add people to your LinkedIn list that you have worked with. 
Um, for example, a number of you have asked to be added to my LinkedIn network, but my LinkedIn network is with people that I have worked with before so that when we talk to each other and post for each other, we're talking about things that we've worked together on or that we know each other has worked on before. Um, but the Professor Messer LinkedIn page, which is a different page, not my own personal page, but our corporate page, that would be a great one for you to join. Plus, we have our daily pop quiz questions on LinkedIn as well. More questions. Let's keep going through this list. Um, this is... This is one, I love these kinds of questions because they are, they're so obvious in their answer, but I think it's worthwhile to step through. Uh, there's, the, there's the wrong one. There we go. Uh, let's, let's get this question on our list. Do you think AI will make IT slash sysadmin jobs obsolete in the near future? Um, this one is, this one's almost a gimme, isn't it? Not only will it not make these jobs obsolete in the near future. It will not make these jobs obsolete in the far future, um, at least not in its current form. Um, if you look at what the industry is telling us that AI is, there is a lot of A with the automation. There's very little I. There's no I to be seen. There's, there's practically zero I. Really, it's more of A. Do you think A will make this the IT sysadmin jobs obsolete in the near future? Um, A might help, but then again, we've been automating and orchestrating and scripting and making, trying to make our life easier as technologists since we've had computers. This is nothing new in our industry to automate. It's been a big thing over the last five years or so that, wow, we could use Python and PowerShell and we could automate so much of our job. Well, yeah, that's what we've been doing for the past 30 years. We've been using tools like PowerShell and, 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 and tools like Python and tools like batch files and scripts, shell scripts and Perl and very simplified scripting languages. And we've been automating. We've been doing this forever uh, because we are, as humans, I'm really just speaking for myself. We're lazy. We don't want to have to sit here at a screen and type in the same thing over and over. Oh, we need to make a configuration change to 50 routers. All right, let me log into the first router and make the change. Commit. Now let's go to the next router. Make the change. Commit. Okay, we're two down, 48 to go. Who wants to do that? That's so boring. And nobody wants to be in that position. So I tell people all the time, of course, we're going to automate that. Of course, we're going to find a way to have our scripting talk with the API that's associated with the router or the firewall and simply send it one command that's pushed out 50 times and takes care of this in a matter of seconds that would have normally taken us hours. That is not AI. That is simply smart people doing intelligent forms of automation. So that's what we're doing. AI is, has really been a great tool to make companies look better. I'm getting a lot of AI features being added to things that I use every day that solve problems I never had. <laughs> so when you start seeing technologies being rolled out that solves a problem that doesn't exist, that's when you know that perhaps it's not quite ready for prime time yet. And that's pretty much what I've seen with AI so far is that it solves a lot of problems that I simply do not have yet or perhaps ever will. Will this turn into something that becomes better over time? We can only hope. Will it add additional automation functionality to things that we do today? Perhaps. One of the things that we often find in our industry, though, is that automation is not the same thing as somebody doing something automatically, which is, is questionable. There was a time very early on in the, in the world of networking as a network administrator, and we were rolling out TIM 100 networks. There's an a option if you've ever connected to a network this way, over TIM 100 or, or gigabit speeds or even faster. There's an auto-negotiate option, the auto option. Whenever you see an automatic option, when it deals with two devices talking to each other, it works great 99% of the time. Works flawlessly 
99% of the time. The time when it, that 1% of the time when it doesn't work properly is always on a Sunday morning at 3 a.m. when my phone rings. And that's why very early on, so many people turned off auto negotiation and manually set each side so they would always have the same speed and the same duplex. You never got a phone call on a Sunday morning at 3 a.m. again. So automatic, that at least the, the automatic process for auto negotiation and Ethernet got better through the years, thankfully. And these days, it's just turned on automatic and it works flawlessly. And quite honestly, we simplified the process with gigabit so there were fewer options to choose from, which made our life so much better. So these days, I think everything's on automatic. But the same problem occurs whenever you turn on something and hope that it's going to do it automatically. It sometimes doesn't or it does it wrong. It does it unautomatically. It does it poorly. So th those are the challenges I think that we have in technology is we have a very narrow range of tolerance. And the thing about computers is if you give it the same input and the same process every time, it will give you the same output every time. It is very consistent. If it wasn't, we'd be in trouble. And when you go outside the scope of that consistency, it now creates bigger problems for us. So AI will be great when it gets to a point where we can guarantee its results. Until then, if then ever occurs, we will probably keep it at arm's length so that we can have control over what these systems are doing. Now, will it be able to write code someday and build its own applications? And well, maybe, but I'm not in the world of application development. So that's not my thing. I'm more in the world of information technology and making sure that I can set up, configure, maintain, secure, and control all of the data in our organizations. So that's, I think, uh, you don't have to worry about AI taking your job. You don't have to worry about AI stealing your woman. You don't have to worry about AI suddenly swooping in and sitting at your desk when you get there in the morning on a Monday. It's not going to be that way. Uh, we'll be able to use different capabilities of AI to do different things. But in this particular case, you don't have to worry, at least not now. And I would argue perhaps not in the longer term future either. It just is not good enough yet to be able to do that. It, it, have you read some of the stuff it writes? It's awful. Uh, have you have I've had people try to use it for training and they'll they'll ask it a question about technology and the answer it gets gives them back is wrong. It's just incorrect. And now you're spending more time unlearning what it told you incorrectly than simply learning it right to begin with. That's that's where we are. I think with AI, it's my opinion on where we are with AI. Is it is it um, is it going to change? We'll see. Check. Ask me next month. Ask me next year. We'll see where it is. Uh, we'll figure out where it is. See, Matthew says AI stole his woman. That's what I'm talking about. Can't trust it. Cannot trust it. We didn't really like her anyway. Not right, Matthew. The uh, next on our list as we go through these questions. Um, so this is, this is, there's quite a bit of questions coming in. Uh, I want to get the good ones that are on this list that might apply. Some of you are asking some amazing questions, by the way. Um, so this is a pretty good one. We talked a little bit about career already. This is another good career question from Omar who says, does it matter on the location where you live in the U.S. to get a job in networking like a network engineer? If so, which state do you believe has the most jobs for people with a Cisco certified network administrator cert and experience with network devices. I, I really built my, my career on the networking side of things. I like to think that. Now, ultimately, I ended up in the cybersecurity piece. But whenever I started on the desktop and server side, but where I really got some traction was on the network. There was just something about the packets and the technologies on the networking side that really appealed to me. And I really enjoyed being a uh, network administration. And in, in fact, it really lends itself into a position in security because once you understand what's going on over the network, you can do almost anything with this. So that's that part's a lot of fun on the network side. So it's a good question Omar asks about 
where do you go to get these networking jobs? Where are they? Should I go to that place? Should I move to that city, wherever it happens to be? Now, fortunately, one of the things that is uh, pretty uh, well-known, at least in every company I've ever visited, is they all have a network. Every single organization in the world, in the U.S., in Canada, in the, in the known universe, has a network. And to be able to use that network, they need engineers that can properly administer, plan, and improve on those networks. One of the things that I think is useful to know is there are differences on where jobs might be depending on where you are in the country. So there is some consideration there you should think about. Obviously, a larger area, uh, a larger uh, industrial or larger city is a place that will have more networking positions because every single place in that city has a network. You sort of see where this is going. But there are some differences there. There are some 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 dramatic differences. You get into places like um, the D.C. area, the Washington, D.C. area, Virginia, Maryland, D.C. There is a huge number of federal agencies that have enormous networks, some of those networks with very sensitive information. You actually need additional clearances to be able to work on those particular networks. So that may be a little bit of a stumbling block if you happen to live in D.C. or the D.C. area. But if you move to Dallas or you look at L.A. or you look at Miami or you look at organizations that work out of Silicon Valley, they need a lot of networking expertise. So you may find that depending on where you are in the world, you may already have a plethora, a cornucopia of networking positions available in your particular area. And I would highly encourage you to have a look at the different options that are within LinkedIn Learning and Dice and all of the other online job posting sites, because you can, of course, filter by the location. And you should try that. Try Cincinnati. Try uh, Seattle. Try Tacoma, try Tallahassee. You know, you'll find differences depending on what you type in there. And that's certainly a consideration if you're looking for a job, but it shouldn't be hard to find a job working as a network engineer. You will certainly find a lot more jobs as a networking engineer than someone who is an entry-level position in cybersecurity or someone who is getting a position as a, uh, a data engineer, someone working with big data. So those types of positions are very niche and relative to the large number of jobs available in IT overall, those are relatively small number of positions. But jobs like help desk, jobs like a network administrator, jobs like a Windows administrator, a Linux administrator, those tend to be jobs that are available in practically every geography, and you should not have any problem finding those particular positions. So I don't think it matters where you live in the U.S. Now, of course, if you live in an area, maybe you live in Hawaii, well, you have a limited number of positions in that area, and it's difficult to go outside that area because it's the ocean. So you're on an island. You There are a limited number of jobs on that island. So uh, it becomes very, very similar if you are in a small uh, rural area of the United States. There may be limited jobs there, too, and it's very your closest large city may be hours away. So it's a similar situation. You have to at least position yourself where the jobs happen to be, but finding a job in networking shouldn't have a problem at all. I know we're getting close to the top of the hour, but let's get a couple more questions in. We're going so well here. I'm going to take a sip so that we can do that. From that small amount <clears throat> that is there. Um, let's see what else is here and what other things might might be coming in. Uh, to this list. We have a couple more questions that have been, we have a lot more questions that have been submitted. So I'm kind of scrolling, 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 and being able to work through this. <clears throat> this is a very common question. I probably answered this question via email to someone else earlier this week, probably a couple of times this week. This is from uh, Bernard who asks, or Bernard who asks, uh, what is your best advice to someone changing to the IT field after working in higher education for over 15 years? This is not an unusual question. This is a very common question for those of you that um, have been working as a different type of position. This is something that happens um, for many different reasons. So 
this is your second career. This is a very common circumstance where you've been working in a particular career for a number of years, and then something happens that makes you realize this is probably not the career you want to stay in or retire from. You want to try a different career, I would say, for the second half of your career. It's your new career. This happens all the time. And I get emails from people that were police officers. They were nurses. They worked in education. They worked for a transportation company. Uh, they worked as whatever the job is, and they want to move into IT. So the part that I find interesting is, um, or the part that perhaps even more important, is you really have to look at the overall market in your area to see what's available. But there are some, there's some good parts to this and bad parts to this. First, I think moving into IT is, of course, a great idea, but I'm very bullish on IT. I believe that IT can provide you with opportunity, flexibility, and money that you in many ways can't find in other vertical type of markets. So working in education has a very different set of those characteristics than someone who works in IT. And since I've been in IT and was able to move up through the ranks and have some amazing jobs where I had a lot of flexibility. I got to choose the type of job I wanted. I got to choose where that job happened to be. And in many cases, I got to choose how much I wanted to make because I just kept moving up until I made the amount of money I wanted to make. There's very few areas uh, or jobs that you could have in different industries that provide you with that level of flexibility. That is just remarkable. You don't get that in medicine. You don't get that in education. You don't get that in law. Uh, IT is one of these very unusual places where you can do practically anything. And if you are driven enough, there really is no ceiling. So I see the appeal and I, I understand the appeal and I encourage people who want to move into IT to be able to do that. Here's the challenge, though. There's always a negative, of course. One of the challenges if you're changing fields is you tend to have to start at the bottom. And if you've been working in education for 15 years, well, I was going to say you're now making money, but you might not be if you're working in higher education. Oh, higher education, you might be. If you're working at a university, maybe there is a little more money there. But if you're getting into IT, you kind of have to start at the bottom again and work your way up. So there might be a pay hit that you have to take with the idea and the expectation that you're going to work to move up and and increase the amount of money that you're going to make because you're going to go get certifications. You're going to work hard to learn this technology. And it would not be unusual for somebody in an entry level position to move up into a higher level position in nine months to a year if you are aggressive and a number of things fall into place for you. In the IT industry, we tend to call this the three year rule that if you're in a, in a job more than three years, you should have jumped already. Like three years is the time. All I've been here three years, time to start looking for another position somewhere so that I can move up and make more money. Uh, we tend to, to speak very flippantly about that, but it sort of works out that way. Um, my last position, I worked in a job for seven years. I, I wasn't leaving Palo Alto Networks. That job was too good. So sometimes three-year rule doesn't, doesn't count. Uh, sometimes there are other things that are more important than the three-year rule. So you may have to start and there may be a hit with your money, but know that there are ways to move up very quickly and to make up that difference in a very short period of time. And I would say even exceed what you would have been making. There are people in technology right now, they're making more than lawyers. They're making more than doctors. They're doing very well as technologists. So I think the, the opportunity is there and, and certainly available for you to take that. I'll also say that if you're someone who is, is moving to a different area, you're moving out of higher education and you're moving into technology, you need to take advantage of the relationships that you've built in education. That that may not seem obvious if you're moving into technology. You may be thinking, well, I'm leaving everybody behind because I'm going to go get a technology position. But I will tell you, just like every organization has a networking team, every higher education organization has an IT department. And so some of the knowledge you have in your core field can be applied into technology. In fact, 
in IT, we love it when there are people that understand the business because we've spent so much time getting our Microsoft certification, understanding how to manage our new Microsoft Active Directory infrastructure, how to deal with merging different trees together. The forests are now have to be working properly between this new company that we acquired. There's a set of rights and we're in the, we're in the weeds of technology. And the, the people that own the company will walk in and say, I know you're spending a lot of time on this Active Directory thing, but you know we make pencils, right? So how do we make more pencils using this technology? I mean, they want to bring that together. Now, if you've never worked on the pencil making side, you may have no idea. It may take some research to go out and see, well, I don't know. What does it take to make pencils? Where does the raw materials come from? And how do we put those raw materials together? And then how we distribute them? And how can we improve on this process? But if you've already been working on the pencil making side, you know exactly where the downsides are. You know exactly where things need to be made more efficient. Those are the people we want in IT so that we can build systems and technologies that make that process run better, that make the profits go up, that makes the bosses happy, and ultimately gives you either a better position or a place where you can go to get a better position later. That's the real key. And if you have, if you've been in a healthcare, go find a healthcare IT department. If you're in education, go find an education IT department. If you are in, uh, in law, go find a legal IT department. That doesn't always happen, but it is an opportunity. And you can ask around at the people you know, either within your organization or in similar organizations, do you know if your IT department is hiring, I'm looking to move into that, that world? And do you have someone I can talk to? And when do they go to the Microsoft user group meeting? Because I want to meet them. So those are opportunities. And I've had people tell me they've just sent blind LinkedIn messages to people who are in a, a senior manager or a director role in a company that does healthcare, medicine, or whatever it happens to be. And they have asked them directly, hey, I'm, I'm looking at getting into IT. I'm moving out of the higher education space, and I'm looking to do more in, in the IT field. What would you recommend that I do? What certifications would you recommend I get? What are the three things that you would be looking for to hire somebody who has been in that position. They would know. They would have the absolute right advice for you. So find those people and ask them. One of the things we do a really good job of in this industry, and I don't think we speak about it enough, is we're really good at helping each other. On my LinkedIn group, People are constantly sending messages out. We got a job opening over here. We have people, we're looking for people in this area. Uh, if you're in LA, we got a position open. We're constantly sending that information back and forth. And I have had places when I worked at Palo Alto Networks and I knew that a position opened up in Chicago, I found the people on my LinkedIn group. I'm like, oh, I know who would be perfect for this. Let me send her a message. She is amazing systems engineer and see if this is something she'd be interested in and send, it, send off the LinkedIn message did it all the time. We do that a lot. So sending a blind note to somebody on LinkedIn isn't as crazy as you might think. It's not like you're spamming someone. You're asking for uh, some advice. You're not asking for a job. You're not even asking them to look at your resume. You're just saying, what would you want in someone you're hiring to have? And maybe they'll answer. Maybe they won't. But if they don't answer, you're getting exactly the same information you have today. Nothing was lost. But if they do answer, now you have some valuable intel. You've built a relationship or those steps towards building that, tech, that, that professional relationship with someone who's already in that position. And you might even ask them, this was, this was great feedback. I'm going to work on this and work on that. And we'll have this ready. Do you know of anybody in the industry right now who's hiring? Just ask. So that is, that's, that's some good ways to do this. And in fact, it sort of lends in itself to the conversation we had earlier about the user group meetings. That same conversation can be had with the people at that user group meetings. Hey, you know, I'm moving out of healthcare and I'm moving into IT. I've been working on my A plus and my network plus. What other things would you recommend? What type of people do you hire? What, what's the minimum for the people that are coming in for your help desk? They'll tell you. They're happy to tell you, um, especially if they're standing in front of you. Well, we look for this, we look for this, we look for this. That's what I would recommend. Write those things down. Go do that. You know, that's good advice. 
Because even if that company doesn't hire you, other people are looking for similar characteristics. So that's what I would recommend. Um, and, and the people that we work with, the people that we know, and the people that that we live with, we go to, they're our next door neighbors, uh, they go to church with us, our, our kids go to the same school, uh, I see them at a, a meeting uh, that I attend all the time, they're, uh, whatever it is, ask those people, hey, do you know anybody who's hiring IT right now? I'm throwing my resume out at a few folks. I'm really looking for somebody who's hiring entry-level IT. Do you have any connections? Those connections are so valuable. And when you've been in around, you've had a job somewhere else for 15 years, you've built some good connections. People want to help you. Take, I want to say take advantage of that. You're not taking advantage of anyone. They would like to help you. You have to reach out and ask. So don't miss that opportunity to ask people because you'll be surprised how much they might be willing to help you. Um, let's keep asking. I've got so many questions are coming in. Um, along these lines, we talked earlier about the changes between the 601 and 701 certification exams. Is the Security Plus SY0601 still going to be acknowledged by hiring managers now that there's a 701? And, and here's the real key. Chris says, I just passed my 601 today. <laughs> So this is pretty important for Chris to know. Um, here's the fun part. The SY0601 and the SY0701 are versions of exams. They're the version of the test. It's the mix of questions you have to answer to become certified. When you passed your SY0601 exam, you became Security Plus certified. You did not become SY0601 Security Plus Certified. Other people do not become SY0701 Security Plus Certified. You are simply Security Plus Certified. And if you look at your certification, the version of the exam you took is not on there. They don't care. No, in fact, nobody really cares what version of the exam you took as long as you are legitimately Security Plus Certified. The people that took their SY0301 exam 10 years ago and became Security Plus certified and have simply renewed their Security Plus certification every three years and still today continue to have a current and valid Security Plus certification, they are just as Security Plus certified as you are. They are just as Security Plus certified as someone who took the 701 exam and became Security Plus certified. So it doesn't matter how you got certified. The important part is that you are. And hiring managers don't care which version of the exam you took as long as you are Security Plus certified. That's all they care about. Now, somebody has, of course, I, I look forward to your cards and letters, but someone has told me they applied for a position. Because I, I did ask, have you ever applied for a position where they cared which version of the exam that you took? And the vast majority of folks have said, no one cares. And I look at job postings, no one cares. When I talk to, to managers of security departments, no one cares. The only person who told me yes, I, they were admittedly being a little bit cheeky. They said, yes, my manager cared quite a bit which version of the Security Plus exam I took. I said, oh, tell me. Finally, somebody cares. Tell me, what job were you applying for? And they said, I was applying for a job to train people on the 701 exam. <laughs> Well, of course they wanted to know if you took the 701 exam. That doesn't count. That's not what I was asking. So I won't say 100% of the time it, it, it doesn't matter to the hiring manager. Sometimes the hiring manager is hiring somebody to train people on a particular version of the exam. Okay, I guess that's, that's why that would, that would be. That makes sense. So, But the rest of us out here, we don't care. As long as you are Security Plus certified, you're good. That's all that matters. That's all that matters to the hiring managers is that you are legitimate. So you do that, you're good. You're fine. Uh, and a good question because that does come up. And by the way, you passed your 601. Congratulations on passing your certification. So I think that's probably the most important part of that whole question, by the way, is me being able to congratulate you on your brand new Security Plus certification. Well done. 
Uh, other questions uh, that are in here. We're way past the top of the hour. I realize that. Uh, a couple of these. We'll go through these really quick. So a couple here that I'll just hit on because they're quick answers. Um, this one uh, from Seth asks, will you be making courses for the recently announced certifications? Uh, Com CompTIA came out with a press release at the beginning of the year that said, this year, we're doing these certifications. And they're coming out with a few new certifications. They're changing the names of other certifications. Currently, we don't have plans to make courses for those. But if those suddenly those certifications take off and the entire industry says, we need to take that new certification, well, I'm, I'm right there. I will be glad to make a course on that particular thing. But in the time being, I'm in a sort of a, a wait and watch kind of scenario. I want to see how those turn out. We'll see how we'll see what happens with those. Um, I'm I'm very easy to sway. You know, whatever's popular, I just kind of follow it. I'm I'm the worst when it comes to that type of thing. Oh, that football team's winning. I've been a fan forever since last week. So that's that's sort of how I work. So that's the uh, same way with the certification exams. Uh, we'll figure that part out too. Other questions. Um, Here's another quick one. Um, this one, a fine question from Thomas. I don't have a lot of detail here. Thomas asks, hey, how do you know so much about the content of the exams? Very impressive. Does CompTIA give you special access? No, no. Now, I have the same access you do to all of the exam content. I don't know if that's shocking or not. I get no special access. I don't know what goes on behind the scenes, nor do I want to, quite honestly. As someone who's providing you with what I feel is independent training materials, I want to be as independent as possible. It's true that uh, I'm absolutely a CompTIA certified platinum partner. I think there's only 20 of those in the world. Uh, but I'm the, a platinum partner or, or a CompTIA partner because I want to provide you with discounted vouchers, and that was the only way to do that. It doesn't provide me with any extra insight into what's going on behind the scenes, and quite honestly, I just don't ask a lot of questions about that. I prefer being as independent as possible, and so uh, I don't know much about the content of the exams other than what's in the exam objectives. Whenever the exam objectives come out, I just pour through them, and I create all of my content around those objectives. It is a relatively simple process. It's a lot of content. It takes a lot of time to create these courses, months and months and months and months. And that's all I do. This is my full-time job. And it still takes me months and months and months to create these courses. When that, That's all I do all day. I get up, I write content, I go to bed, I just repeat. I do that seven days a week. Whether that's good or bad, that's what, what I do. Um, but I think that speaks to how important it is to really evaluate what's on the exam. And if you go through it with a fine tooth comb like I do, you'll find that you're picking up the details of those exams just the same way I did, because that's the process I went through. So I, I would agree. That's, uh, that is how, that's how I know so much about the exams, because I've read through the exam objectives a million times. L maybe not a million, maybe two million. Two million times. I've read through the exam objectives. And that's that's where that's why I tell you all the time, you really need to read those. They're really good. You should get those. Make sure you you pull those out. Um, other questions. Um, there's another good one I came in to see. It was really quick. I'm trying to do the quick ones here near the end. So we can kind of squeeze in a lot of stuff at all of these. Some of these I've answered, so I apologize if I didn't bring your question up, but it was one that we, you probably have realized we answered when somebody else asked that part of those questions, or at least something relating to that question. Um, other questions that are in here, some of these are really good questions on technology. Some of these are very personal questions, and thank you for sending those in. <laughs> <laughs> I should make a list of the crazy questions we get that we never talk about. No, I'm not. Um, let's keep going through this list and other ones that are there. The other parts of these, um, 
are people asking about other things. You know, one of the the ones that people talk about a lot are practice exams. I mentioned I'm getting my Security Plus practice exams book out shortly. And I do have plans to create practice exams for the Network Plus. There were a couple of questions in here that asked about that. Um, and it's really why aren't there, people ask, why aren't there practice exams for the Network Plus? Well, there aren't any because I just haven't written them yet. I've actually started writing them. So I haven't published them yet, I guess is the more accurate thing to say. Uh, I haven't finished writing them. Um, and so it's really more about time. It's really more about sitting down, writing these, because it's more than just writing a question that's a, more than just writing a random question and then writing the answers. Because the CompTIA exam, for example, does not ask a question that says, what port number does SSL use? They just don't ask those questions. That's that's a trivia question. That's a that's a simple. Oh, it's four forty three. That they don't ask that. That you don't have. They don't ask these memorization questions on the exam. They ask a question where there is a scenario. There's a problem. Here's some of the things we're seeing relating to this problem. What do you think it is? You really have to think about that. You really have to go down that road. So you have to build questions and content that is really focused on that style of questions and answers. The answers are sometimes even more important than the questions. So it just takes time. That's that's really the the answer. It's a bad answer. Nobody likes the answer. It's a horrible answer. It just happens to be reality. It just takes time. And uh, my plan this year is to hopefully provide you with a Network Plus practice exams book. I would love to do it this year. So we'll We'll see what happens. Now Now we get to find out. It's one of those things where we look back in December. What happened this year? Let's see if this is on the list. We can You can bring up this video and say, wait, you said in January. And then I get to dance around the fact that it either exists or it doesn't at that point. You can hold me to the fire. I have no problem with that. Easy, easy, easy uh, to, to send that my way. I'm more than happy to look at it. You can't you can't make me angry by asking a question. You can't send me an email that gets me riled up. I'm on the internet and it all just bounces off at this point. I'm, the skin is super thick. Uh, it's very, very, it's like, it's like bark. It's, it's just not going to happen. Um, other questions. I want to do one more because we are way past our top of the hour. The Mrs. Professor Messer has me on a, a tight timing for this. So I want to be sure I cover all the important things that you are sending in. Um, the one that uh, that came through, this is a pretty good one because we've been talking about career this whole time. It's sort of been a good theme. Um, if you can't find employment, should you try freelance? You know, there's different things you can do if you can't find the job you want in IT or there are just no positions open in your area. What can you do? Now, freelancing is certainly an idea. There are many third-party websites that can help you sort of set up your freelance table, your freelance store, and then people can come along and ask for your help. They can hire you online. So the, the Fivers of the World and the other similar style uh, websites are very good at putting together knowledgeable people with people that need the knowledge. And then you can be one of those folks. That's, that is one way that you can get some experience and become more familiar with the technologies and maybe even work for less while you're learning a little bit more and positioning yourself for a bigger role. Um, it's not a great way to do it, but it, it does bring in at least some dollars. And there may be a way to scale that or find a niche that nobody else is covering and jump into that niche and cover, cover your bases. You may have more stuff to do during the day than you know what to do with. Um, that's certainly possible. Some organizations uh, will hire you on as a contractor. This is this is questionable, at least from a tax perspective, a legal perspective, just because a company puts you into the role of a contractor from a tax perspective doesn't necessarily mean they treat you as a contractor, which means that you probably shouldn't be one. And in the world of uh, tax law and rules and regulations, I am not the person to talk to. But I will tell you that you want to find an employer that if you're working at a particular time frame and they are requiring you to be at a certain place at a certain time and they are making the rules on what you do, you're an employee and you should be a W-2 employee. If they are making you a contractor, that's a different world. You're a third party. You're, you're an independent party as a contractor. 
and uh, and that's a little bit different. And there may be some roles where you can provide professional services. You can be uh, some of the larger companies. I know that when I worked for Palo Alto Networks, for Network General, for McAfee, and some of the other companies, large companies I worked for, we did a lot of professional services. I was not on the professional services team, although early on with Palo Alto Networks, we were a small group and I did perform professional services for them. So I've implemented and converted a number of different people's firewalls to Palo Alto Networks and configured them and set them up and doing these week or two week long engagements. Um, when I did that, when we worked through those, um, it was one where we would often bring in a third party that could perform some of that work for us just on a temporary basis. And once that professional services was done, they could go back to doing whatever it is they did. And maybe they did other professional services at the same time. So if you can get on the list of some of these companies as an adjunct or an additional resource for their professional services team, you may find yourself being brought in to handle particular functions that their group either can't or won't do. And that may be something to consider as well. So if you know somebody in those professional services teams or you, again, send a LinkedIn note off to those professional services team and ask them, hey, you're the director of professional services at Palo Alto Networks. Are there times when you might want to hire a third party to handle a certain uh, SIM implementation or a firewall rule conversion or whatever it happens to be, whatever you do the best, ask them. They'll be able to tell you. And that's one of those times where maybe it's not freelance, but maybe it is freelance. Maybe you are offering professional services and they can give you a particular hourly rate or a, a fixed fee to be able to, to perform those functions and be an additional set of eyes and hands for their existing professional services team. And who knows, it might lead to a much larger professional services gig with that organization, or maybe you're just the go-to person who's brought in every couple of weeks to help with this particular project and you make a little money on the side. Everybody needs the hustle. And that's that's a good place to go with that. Well, I think that's that's probably a good place to finish up our conversation on our very first study group of the year. I want to thank all of you for being here and hanging out with us. I'll also remind you if you enjoyed this video and it's something you like, I don't often ask for likes and subscriptions. Uh, I don't think it's something I'm, I'm trying to drive towards, but my friends at YouTube and my the folks that I work with who help manage my account, those folks really look at those numbers. So I'm very sensitive to letting them know that the content that we're creating is something that other people would like as well. So if you're watching my courses uh, offline, it's not a live stream, just going through my Security Plus course or my A Plus course or Network Plus, and you like that video, give it a thumbs up. It is amazing what that does uh, for us out here, and it's something you can do for free. It really does help quite a bit. And if you like this video, we'd love it if you give it a thumbs up. They do look at those, and uh, it does help us quite a bit. We're talking with our friends over on YouTube, and I have a, a meeting for those and working working with them all the time. We meet up and, and talk about the channel, and they give me ideas of things they're working on. And YouTube's doing a lot of interesting things with education these days. Those thumbs up help quite a bit. Thanks for being here and joining us. We love doing these live streams. We could, we literally could not do them without you. It's so important that you're here. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate that. And we've got more of these. Come on back two days from now on Thursday. We have our core two study group where I have a whole new set of questions, a whole new set of after show questions that you could submit. We always have a good time with that as well. Until then, thanks for joining us and we will see you next time on the A Plus Study Group. Thanks, everybody.